that's rad. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming. We'll go ahead and we'll get started tonight uh, with our riveting agenda. That's very got a lot of controversy to it. It looks like. So uh, first of all, let's uh, go ahead and get started at the beginning, and I'll uh, the commission wants to take a look at the minutes and let me know if there are any comments, amendments, or uh, take a motion for approval. We approved the ones from the night. Oh no, they weren't in there, right? They didn't open correctly at the last meeting. So we are approving both the amendments from the November 9th and the one two weeks before the 26th of October. Uh huh. I'll move that we approve the minutes from the last two meetings. No. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to load them up because I can never connect to the Wi-Fi here. For some reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the November 9th meeting. I will second those. I've got a motion and second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstains? Great. Motion carries. Uh, secondly, report from the chair. I have nothing to report. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Nothing at this time. Uh, and a report from the director. I just want to remind people of the training that's tomorrow night. If you can make it, um, that would be great. Um, and that we only have one meeting, well, one more meeting, real meeting after, after tonight this year. So only December 14th. There's no second meeting in December. So that's it. Uh, so with that, we'll go and move on to the citywide uh, draft, the transit master plan. Uh, welcome staff back up. Uh, we had kind of a review of this at our last meeting, and we were going to take a deeper look. The, I uh, believe the public comments section we left open. And so do, I don't know, if staff has anything additional they'd like to add, or if, do you have anything you want to add, or, um, or do you, does there, anyone in the commission feel like they want a review or any of the... Highlights, I think we, we were all here for the last meeting, right? Yes. You want one additional like review? We want them to go over anything or do you want to give them a general overview or do you want to ask questions or? Um, well, well, seeing none, uh, do you guys have anything to add? No comments? We've, just, we've had a few comments filter in. Um, Largely, they've been supportive. They've been pretty reflective of the summary that I sent you before, a couple of new things um, that we're looking at how to address in the plan. Okay. Uh, great. Well, I'll see if there are there any public comments on it in the cards. Uh, is George Chapman here? Oh, we're going to the public comments All right, so portion. We'll, Sorry, you can we'll step back. Down. Yes. You can stay here. I won't bite. <laughs> and there's a lot of microphones. Okay, I'm asking, my name is George Chapman. I'm asking you not to approve the citywide transit master plan. There are a whole bunch of problems with it. It's way too early. It needs a lot more public comment. When I uh, filed my uh, public comments on November 7th, the deadline date, there were 33 people on Open City Hall. There are 400 now. That means that the comments that have been received, hundreds of comments that have been received are not included in the citywide transit master plan. That's a an insult to the citizens that you should want to hear from. So I'm asking you not to approve it. In addition, one of the most important projects for Salt Lake City is the airport tracks reconfiguration. That's not in here. It should be. So that's another issue. The other big issue is Salt Lake City Council actually sent a downtown master plan discussion and decision on whether or not to have a rail system back to the transit plan. There's a little note added to the approval of the downtown plan that the rail project is contingent on what the master transit plan says. So that is what happened is the master transit plan didn't look at that note 
It said, we're going to just put in what the downtown plan said. So Salt Lake City Council is saying, we'll look at the transit master plan, uh, transit master plan is saying, we'll look at Salt Lake City Council. There's a disconnect there, and it needs to be taken care of. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other issues. You don't talk about elderly uh, encouragement to use hive passes. Uh, you don't talk about the financial constraints. If you build a $100 million downtown streetcar, and that's what it's going to cost locally, you are going to take that money out of local increased bus service, no matter what you do. You're also talking about very expensive buses, BRTs, excuse me, on 900 East, uh, State Street, a whole bunch of other places that really could use better bus service, period. And instead of taking money away from better bus service and putting it into BRTs, you should be having better neighborhood bus service. The financial constraints aren't listed in the uh, transit master plan. You don't have priorities. And what happened when you did it with, there's also a mountain transportation plan, a neutral, uh, on there, and uh, that's the canyon tunnel system. You shouldn't have any of this stuff in here. It's a very complicated plant, hundreds of pages. I don't have time to tell it all to you. I sent something in, but it's many, many pages. This plan is not ready for prime time. Uh, I encourage you not to approve it. Thanks for listening. Any questions, comments? Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else from the public that would like to comment on this issue? Judy? Just please uh, state your name in the uh, microphone for, for the record. Just call me Grace. <laughs> Step on his foot. I'm Judy Short from the Sugar House Community Council. And I think you know from the number of times you see me, we've been pretty busy. And all of a sudden we realized this was coming at us and we hadn't had a chance to look at it. So I asked uh, Larry Migliazio to look at the plan since he's chair of our transportation committee. He's home tonight sick as a dog, but he did read it. He's a transportation planner, recently retired. So he, he understands all the stuff that's in there that probably Juliana wrote that makes no sense to me at all. So let me just read to you his plans. Um, I think the, the basic thing we're after is bus service. Get us a way to get from here to there. And we need a lot of it, and we need it soon. It's great to have all the streetcars, but that's down the road. That takes a lot of money. Buses are cheaper. Paving the streets needs to happen. There's so many infrastructure needs that we have that we think this ought to be staged, like in the next five years, we will have the grid system of buses up and running every 15 minutes and make it work. And then maybe 15 years from now, we can start talking about streetcars and things that cost huge amounts of money. So what Larry says is a simplification and a back to basics approach should be taken. The tier one, tier two approach with all the niceties mentioned is too complex and delays a usable bus system. Let's forget tier one and simply go to tier two. And the routes, add the routes now and the amenities later. Let's work to get the public on the buses. We all know the main issue is lack of routes and frequency of service. Other items mentioned are good, but should be secondary. Implement the grid now. Security and crime mitigations are not mentioned. Energy efficient, non-polluting transit system is not in the goals. We should favor the grid model in Salt Lake and radial model outside Salt Lake with parking at the outer nodes. Half mile between parallel grid routes is okay, provided transfer points are provided at grid route crossings. This should be the starting point. Public education program on how to use the system. I think there are a lot of people that would be riding the bus if, if they had more information on how to make it work for them. Page 2 to 11 states others are working on Foothill Drive. This plan ought to be incorporated with the Foothill Drive plan. They ought to be seamlessly merged together. There's no coordination indicated in this. And there's no transit hubs with parking. We really need to have park and rides. The Sugar House Streetcar is a great example of that. A lot more people would ride it if they could get their car somewhere close so they could walk home when they get back from work. So it should be more specific. Say what we're going to do and by when. 
Let's start with the buses. Thanks. Questions? Um, we're trying to keep questions just, to, just for comment for the portion. We'll do okay. questions afterwards. Uh, and then Don Butterfield just submitted a card for those who want to come up and speak. And again, just state your name and the microphone for the public record, please. Don Butterfield. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about the transit master plan, uh, which I, I believe that uh, I would recommend that you all just table it and send it back to the transportation department and let them uh, redo this. Uh, their, their modus operandi put them in a, in a situation where they have, in, in my opinion, have neglected the, the simple and elegant solutions to our transportation problems that will impact us now instead of five to 10 years down the road. The governor's Office of Economic Development tells us that by 2030, our population will double. And we can see that in the congestion that's coming along now, and each year it seems to get worse and worse. And these uh, projects uh, streetcars are they're, they're, they're a good idea in a, in a mature uh, routes that are, are already heavily used and, and can work that way. But when we're starting out and needing to establish good, solid uh, best scheduling and 15-minute frequency to, that people can rely on, we need to do that now. Uh, the simple fact about it also is that, uh, as you all may be aware, that uh, in affordable housing and other housing in the city, you know, we're, there's just not a lot of vacant land around to build. And uh, where are these people going to go? If they can't live in the city, well, they're going to commute in. And that's going to provide more problems, more congestion for us. And it just keeps adding more and more each year. So the, the simple and elegant solutions are, are buses. And these rail projects are just too expensive. It holds the city to uh, money that we don't need to be spending on these projects. And with some of that money, we can also spend on our infrastructure uh, that needs to be done, our roads, our sidewalks. There's a lot of work that needs to be done that we've uh, put off when things were tight and, and our budgets were really, really tight. And so we, you know, we're trying to catch back up. Well, if we keep spending all of our money on, on projects that don't solve the problem, but way down the line, it, you know, it just puts us further and further behind where we could catch up and make a, 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 a real difference back into our city. Hey, thank, thank you. We're, we're trying to keep comments about two minutes. If you could wrap up here. And uh, the biggest thing that uh, right now I, I want to talk against the uh, South Davis uh, BART and an enhanced bus would work just as well and it's less expensive than using that uh, a BART coming down from uh, South Davis County and I understand that that would be a, a good asset but we still don't know about ridership. We think it would be good, but an enhanced bus would be a better solution, a cheaper solution than a bar would be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there additional comments from the public on the transit master plan? Uh, great. If we could have staff come back up real quick. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing portion uh, on this topic. And I've got a couple of questions, I think, for you guys to kind of respond to some of the public. Um, do you guys okay if I just go through my list? Like I haven't done before. Um, so, so one, I mean, there was a comment about, uh, obviously, the, the Open City Hall closed down on the 7th and comments coming in before going from seven to 400 people being active. Could you talk about what maybe uh, Mr. Chapman was getting at there and if those 400 people were actively participating in this? topic or something else, just kind of for the record? Um, so all the comments that we received were considered, and Open City Hall reports two things. It reports the number of people who visit um, and just look at the topic, and then it reports the number of people who actually submit a response. Um, and it's 
very consistent with most of the things we do to receive a lot more visits than we do comments, pretty significantly more. A lot of people will just look and say, oh, okay, I don't have any real issues with this, or, and so they don't submit comments. Um, but that's pretty standard. Um, and for us, we've communicated throughout our outreach process that we accept comments throughout the process regardless. And so... So you know, um, we've closed the Open City Hall. People still could have commented Yeah, and I'm date. getting emails and phone calls um, still now and, and incorporate all those comments. It's just that it, for the purposes of summarizing the comments for you for our last meeting, um, we had a closed date so that we had a cutoff for what would be summarized in the staff report. You could prep, do your prep work. Yep. Um, and then I assume those comments are available to public record if anyone wanted to see them or city council could review them as part of their review process? Yep. Great. Um, secondly, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the role of a master plan and budgeting in the master plan. Um, you know, is the master plan intended to kind of as a general guiding document that's helping to, you know, understand priorities for which city council and people in future years can place budget priorities around, or is a master plan typically something that will have specific budgets that we should be weighing items against each other like the public has reflected? Just talk about the purpose of a master plan, please. You can take that one if you'd like. Oh, please do. So yeah, the transit master plan or any uh, master plan like it is intended to be more policy direction. Um, we do include some high level um, cost analysis um, so we can prioritize for staff guidance, what we do want to take um, to legislative bodies to ask for resources, whether it's city council or other funding opportunities. So there is some level of priority associated with what's the most important thing to work on. Um, that might some some of those things might be very expensive, um, and so that's part of the consideration. But it's not the only consideration. Um, but it's really more about a policy policy guidance and setting the vision, the 20 year vision for, um, in this case, transit for Salt Lake City. Um, and that's the other element is that it's a locally based plan. So this is the transit vision for Salt Lake City proper. UTA does a pretty good job of providing regional transit. And so it does, our local plan does respond to a lot of work that UTA has done um, for their regional system. Um, but we wanted to take a look at and see what would, what would we need to invest in Salt Lake City to improve transit for Salt Lake City itself. And then there was um, certainly a number of comments related to bus service, and I feel like I've looked at the plan last night that, that you, you do address bus service um, and do address rapid bus service and frequency and timing and hours and so forth and recommendations for those in the plan. I'm wondering if, you know, maybe from your review, being at open houses or from comments you've received, if you could maybe elaborate on what maybe some of the comments, some more specifics I'm just not sure what they were referring to that might be missing from the plan. Maybe you might know, know better. My guess is that we just need to communicate more clearly because I think we're in agreement uh, with those comments. So the... Um, you outline routes, you talk about a grid system, correct. you outline frequency of service, hours of operation, recommendations for extension. The, the, rough the plan routes. is largely mode neutral, so we didn't say necessarily that, that it's only buses that we're talking about, but we did identify the only corridors where we would want to, so streetcar, as an example, is a very high intensity capital um, investment. It would require a high intense capital investment to make that happen. And so we didn't, we didn't necessarily plan out where streetcar lines would go. We said where it would make sense to invest a lot in capital. Um, and that would be a corridor like Second South, where we already have really great bus service. And if in the future we wanted to accommodate more growth, um, that's a corridor where it might make sense to invest in a higher level of capital that could be streetcar. Um, but the system as a whole and the plan, what mo makes the most sense given the, the ridership gains and, and the other goals that we have in mind, the bus-based mode does make the most sense for um, 90 plus percent of the corridors that we analyzed and proposed in the plan. And, and is outlined in the plan. Correct. Yes. And then you, I mean, another general comment was about, you know, really prioritizing frequency of bus service over infrastructure improvements. And I mean, I, I know there's certainly the conversation about a streetcar is one deal, but also your plan outlines things like improved bus stops and signage and, you know, uh, things that help, infrastructure items that kind of help bus service. You feel like those infrastructure items are important to boost ridership, not just and that's why we're investing them, not because you, you can't just increase frequency of service, you also need infrastructure improvements to improve, is that correct? 
Right. So Most of those investments are fairly small investments. So for example, um, I may have mentioned this last time, the 200 South Corridor, we put uh, shelters and benches and ADA accessibility um, and saw about an 18% increase in ridership from before to after. Uh, so they're pretty small scale investments, but they seem to have a pretty big payoff. And it's similar with signage and wayfinding. If people can find transit, they're more likely to ride it. Um, but really the foundation, the, the core of the plan is about frequent service. So every 15 minutes, all day, every day. And then there's a point about security and elderly not being addressed in the plan. Could you maybe touch on those two items? Um, so specifically, we are looking at, um, and I think that the comment with respect to elderly was about um, education and promotion, um, and that uh, is access to hive passes and access to hive passes. So for the hive pass, um, we re make a recommendation of fair and pass programs, expanding and refining those. Um, and we are actually looking at youth, at seniors, at some at family passes, some options um, for specific users and what we might do to improve the program for those people and make it more accessible. Um, and then we also have a recommendation just for education and outreach and there are specific groups that we can reach out to in different ways. We did not necessarily call out older adults specifically on, in a section in the plan, but we do have a goal that addresses um, meeting the needs of, of populations that are more likely to use transit, and that is older, older adults, people with disabilities, people who don't have a car, low income. And so it has been grouped into that element, but the plan is really about making sure that we're building a transit system that works well for everybody. And the easiest customers for us to lose are people who can drive. Um, and so. Essentially, we want to make sure that the system works really well for, for folks that, that do have other choices and understanding that if we do that really well, um, it also has connections to folks who don't have other choices as well because they're trying to use transit right now and they don't have the information that they need, but they're still forced onto transit. And so really understanding that connection is really a, an important part of the plan. Um, there was one more, oh, Hive Pass. We didn't say specifically Hive Pass, but because uh, we wanted to be more, since it's a 20 year plan, um, we didn't want to call out the specific name of the brand. You talk about affordability. Correct. And so access. it's just thinking about how do we make sure we're communicating at a higher level for the master plan itself. Um, because the high pass is, is one thing that we do that helps with affordability, but it's not the only thing necessarily that we'd want to pursue. Could you, talk, could you touch on uh, security and safety and whether how people's, you know, what perceptions are out there from your, you know, public meetings and open houses and how you're trying to address that through the plan? I'll let you start and then I'll... Okay. Um, well, there's a couple of things. I think uh, in terms of safety and security, this is something that UTA actually has a whole department focused on that. Um, I think it's our feeling that we should encourage them uh, and perhaps even make recommendations to make things more safe and secure and to feel more comfortable to people, um, but that it should be system-wide, not just in Salt Lake City. Um, in terms of what we do locally, when we go out and look at, for instance, consolidating or relocating bus stops, we look for places that are well lit, that already have lighting, um, et cetera, so that people are more comfortable at night. Things that don't have visual obstructions that make people feel vulnerable. And so along those lines, we'll do, we'll make sure that that's explicit and the things that the city does have control over, um, that we will make sure that it is, it is specifically said um, in any infrastructure improvements um, that safety and security is taken into, into consideration for what the city has control over in that realm. And then my final question here was there's a, you know, uh, one of the comments about kind of South uh, Davis rapid bus transit, which I know the UTA is really pushing and focusing on. I'm not sure how much, I'm not sure if I really remember catching that in the plan or not, but um, could you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, um, I know it's a project at UTA is more than Salt Lakes, but. The, what we did with this plan is we really looked at local needs, and so in terms of the projects that are being that have been planned or led by others, uh, and and then some of the work that we've done, corridor work that we've done, we just looked at whether this analysis supports those projects from a local transportation perspective. So, the, you know, they've primarily been looked at from a regional perspective. South Davis is a good example of that, uh, and when we looked at it, we said it's consistent with the analysis that we've done. Um, but it is a big investment and we don't make specific mode recommendations. That isn't one of the places that I don't think that we identify as a big capital investment place for the city specifically. Because it would be the state and UTA. Yeah. 
Right, so that relates to the, the regional component of what our, our UTA is responsible for. I think Redwood Road is a good example. Redwood Road is a primary corridor for several cities in the Salt Lake Valley. It's a corridor, and it's an important corridor in Salt Lake City, but it's not our most important corridor. And so it's understanding the regional dynamic of some corridors that do touch Salt Lake City. They are important for some regional connections for other constituents that UTA is concerned with, um, but not necessarily the highest priority for Salt Lake City, and I think that this plan helps to communicate that. Um, and, and the last one I've got was just, and I know that the airport's got its whole redevelopment model and its whole plan that's going on out there, and you guys have thought through how that may impact the transit master plan to the extent that it's relevant, I mean. Um, so largely, I think it's largely relevant actually in terms of the hours of operation from the input that we've had, and there are particular constraints that we are actively working on uh, to extending the hours of operation, but the alignment doesn't change significantly uh, under those new plans. So yeah, it's certainly, the airport is certainly an important node, not just for Salt Lake City, but the entire valley. So um, while we, we did not call out the investments that are happening there specifically in the plan, um, it doesn't mean that we can't acknowledge it in a way, but it's also much more relevant for regional uh, system. So we, we do have confidence that when we think about what we need to do to serve Salt Lake City residents better, um, this plan really is focused on that. Um, but we could certainly make sure that the airport investments get called out specifically. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? Um, aside from the open city, was there any other public process since it's been completed um, that you could speak to for the question came up on is there been enough time for people to comment and that sort of thing um i think so but if people don't think so then um, we want to know that we did a lot of outreach early on in the process as we were developing the plan and then consistently throughout um we had you know a couple thousand comments uh at least from the public um so it was guiding the process throughout and i think what i've experienced at least for, with a lot of people is that they're like yeah we, i generally support this did you think of this you know that kind of thing but um, not a lot of surprises came out of this, this plan. We have an email address that people can access at any point in time. People can also submit comments via the project website, um, and that's open. And then um, I've just been going out and visiting folks, community councils, and anyone who wants to hear you know, specific groups, the Accessibility Council, et cetera. When we reached out, everybody who provided their email address through the process we let them know that the plan is now available. So they were, they, we've, we have many ways that we did reach out to individuals who had expressed interest in the past. Um, we also, we didn't just ask, wait for the community councils to come to us. We actually uh, made sure that all the chairs knew um, if they wanted to uh, have us uh, come to their community council meetings, we were available to do that. And we did have a few of those meetings. And, we, and, and a lot of people have pretty full agendas, but we have plenty of opportunity to continue doing that and going out to the community councils. Our, our intent is to, I'm creating um, essentially a table of edits based on the comments that we've received so far. And so what we want to do is incorporate that in any guidance from this group prior to transmitting to city council. Uh, and then they'll have an additional public hearing process. Okay, so that was my that was my next question: is after here, if we do approve, uh, then there's a continued public process, um, still opportunity for people to engage, and still opportunity for you to incorporate those Absolutely. comments through the city council's decision. Yep. Uh, well, thank you so much. I'll uh, go ahead and bring it back up to the commission for any discussion among the commissioners uh, or a motion or action. I, well, I feel a lot better that, that the uh, conversation is ongoing, that um, you know, they can still take comments from the public. I think a lot of the concern is that the public wants to be heard, and um, if the door is still open, then that's one point that I think works well. Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. I just think that it's, uh, it sounds like it's a, 
living and breathing document continuing forward and and these uh, comments we heard tonight are important and I would encourage you know to keep doing what you're doing and engaging the community because um, there are so many different aspects of the community different populations that are that are affected by transportation um, that you know got to make sure we hear from all of those different groups and and probably outside of those groups that go to community councils as well um, uh, you know lower income communities and and whatnot that utilize the uh, transit systems in our in our city are are so important that they have good access to it so um, I would encourage continue engagement outside of um, the normal structures I would say uh, do we wish to take action I'll make a motion um, I move that we approve this transit plan and positively recommend it to the city council. It's it's just a recommendation. It's not an approval. Oh, just okay. for clarity. Okay, the, we'll make a positive rec a positive recommendation to the city council. I'll second that. Uh, there's a motion in the second. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll start down here. Uh, Sarah? Uh, aye. Ivis? Yes. Andres? Aye. Maureen? Yes. Vice Chair? Madam Vice Chair? Caroline? <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Weston? Yes. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, the 27th Street Cottages Zoning Map Amendment and Subdivision and Plan Development at 868 East, 2700 South. Oh, and 2716 South, 900 East. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission. This is a request for. Um, Approval to develop five residential lots on two properties located at approximately 868 East, 2700 South, and 2716 South and 900 East. Uh, the project requires a zoning map amendment, subdivision, and plan development um, to see fruition. Specifically, concerning the zoning map amendment, um, there's been a request to rezone the property from uh, the R17, which is a single-family residential zone, to the R15, a little bit, dip, little bit smaller lot size. Um, in order to do that, a subdivision would have to occur as well. There's also been a planned development request uh, to create a lot without street frontage. Oh, and I'm sorry, without street frontage and also to create lots that the average lot size is 5,000 square feet. Uh, here is a vicinity map for you. Um, you can see the project site fronts 2700 South and 9th East. Uh, there are a couple of existing homes on the property. The one in the upper left here, uh, the proposal uh, is to dem demolish that home. This is, and that's the home that fronts 27 South. This is the home that fronts 9th East, and that home is um, proposed to, be, to remain. Uh, this photo here is from the back of the property. You can see the house to be demolished here, and you can also see the rear of the house that will remain. This property will be developed uh, for residential use. Here's a more of a site plan for you to show the lot configuration. We have two lots fronting on 27 South. Uh, this property here will be accessed off this, uh, well, it says alley here, but this is just an easement. Um, the lot that does not have street frontage, lot four, will have access off of this easement as well. And there's an existing duplex on this property um, that will uh, gain access as, uh, off of that easement. So it's five lots, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, these are examples of the homes that the applicant has um, provided. This really isn't part of the decision, but I just wanted to show these to you to give you an idea of the quality of home that is proposed for that neighborhood. Um, 
this project went before the uh, Sugar House Community Council, we received documentation from them, essentially say, stating that they liked the project. Judy Short is still here, yes, who may come up and speak to their letter that they um, provided. I have not received any sort of written uh, comment from the public. I did receive a couple of phone calls, but it, they were just information only. Um, and at this time, uh, concerning this project, we recommend that the Planning Commission approve the subdivision and the plan development. Those fall under your purview. Um, and we recommend that you forward a positive recommendation onto the City Council uh, for the question of the MAP amendment. That is a decision that they need to make. And should the um, MAP amendment, the, the, the rezone, fail at the City Council level, then any approvals that would be potentially received from this body tonight would become null and void. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those for you. And this does not require a master plan amendment because it's all single family? No, in terms of the rezone, and I, I outlined that in the staff report for you, the density meets the master plan, <laughs> therefore a master plan amendment isn't necessary. Can you go back to that, the slide you just had up? Oh no, before that, I think, yes. Uh -huh. Can you walk through the orientation? I think I know the orientation of each property, but I want to no hear it from you. These, th this, this property here will access 27 South directly. This property and this property, as well as th th these properties, will access off of an easement, which is, is, a, is an ideal situation from a transportation perspective because it's only one curb cut there and it, it's allowing access for multiple properties. This property will continue to have access off of, of, of Ninth East. That, answer your question yeah and then the one that's at the bottom of the alley or top of the alley it that's, faces the alley as its front it, it, it probably oh we don't we're not no we don't know how they're gonna be oriented necessarily no. you're just talking about okay I, so I, I'm I, a little confused because it's not clear yeah and, <laughs> so, and and we're not concerned with the orientation of the homes if that's what you're talking about I mean I think it would be ideal if these two homes certainly face 2700 south this one would most likely probably face that easement um, I don't imagine that it would face these properties to the south this this property here is accessed off of um, Claiborne Circle so I'd imagine that it would face that 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 direction and I guess that's part of what I'm wondering the ones on to 2700 south it, it makes sense that they continue to face that street but you're saying that's not something we're addressing here no. okay mr. chair can I add a comment to that so the residential zoning districts do have front facade controls that require doors to face the streets and things like that. So for those two properties on 27 or South, they'd have to meet those unless the Planning Commission specifically modifies that. So with a plan development, uh, it has to comply with all applicable zoning regulations um, that aren't otherwise modified by your approval. And those that are modified by your approval, they have to comply with whatever your approval says. So, thanks, Nick. Yeah, I had a question about the front yard. The front yard will be whatever faces the street, right? <laughs> Typically, yes. Okay, and then this like doesn't comply with the minimum. Uh, the minimum five thousand square feet. For the front yard. Uh, I don't understand your question. Um, there's. Did you uh, want to say setback? Yeah. They have, to meet, they have to meet all other zoning requirements for the R15000 district should they receive the rezone. So they will have to meet front yard, require, front yard setback requirements, side yard, and rear yard. They're not asking for any sort of uh, relaxation of that standard from you tonight. And the plan development is really only happening, really applies to then lot four, is that right? Lot four because it doesn't have street frontage and the end it also is not a lot of 5,000 square feet. The overall average of all the lots meets that 5,000 square foot. And okay, and if we were to otherwise, so essentially what the rezone does is allow them to put five, five instead of three lots on this 
configuration. It, it allows some greater density. Yeah. Which is consistent with what's surrounding. It's also consistent with the master plan. That's why we support it. Okay. And you've run the numbers so that if you use the setback to so that it does that if, if ha dwellings that are built there have the appropriate setback for the block face concerning the new in the new zoning, you can still fit you can still fit a home. No, on those I haven't run those numbers. That's up to the developer. He'll have to meet the he'll have to meet base zoning standards. I mean, because we wouldn't want to subdivide it and then have it impossible to build. They're homes. all buildable lots. They're all buildable lots. Yes. Other questions? I'm trying to find exactly what the uh, square footage of lot three and four are, but I'm having a hard time reading the map. Well, lot, this lot here meets the 5,000 square foot. This is the lot that is slightly less, less than, than five. It's like 49. Well, it looks like, I mean, lots, lots one and two are both under 5,000. They're 4850. No, they're both above 5,000 square feet. Lot four will be 4985. Lot three is right at 5,000, a little, little above 5,000. So lot four is the only one that does not meet the absolute 5,000 square foot minimum. And, and, and typically in R1 5,000, you see lots less than 5,000 square feet all over the city. I've, I've owned one of those. It's not unusual. And, and it's very buildable. You're 13. 20 plus 67. I think... I mean, based on the map on page, page am I on, 15 of their, the, what they supplied, lot, f lot three and four are each 50 by 100, roughly, the 5,000, and f lots one and two are 50 by 97, so slightly under 5,000, but not much. And lot five is 100 by 50 as well. It's only, it's lots one and two that are slightly under the 5,000, but only by 150 feet short. Well, their plat's not showing that. Their plat's not showing that? No. Okay. Well, maybe we can, uh, if it's okay, can we invite the applicant up and maybe the applicant could um, talk through their project, what they'd like to do, and maybe answer some of the questions specifically? Yes, I'm Adam Nash. I'm the applicant of this and the next... Uh, could you uh, speak closer to the microphone? You can just way up forward. Or you can slide it forward and, and state your name and. Uh, Adam Nash, 4376 South, 700 East, in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84107, and I am the applicant of this property and the project. The owner is also here, uh, Colin Strasser, and we've been working on this project for about a year with your staff to get to this point. If you don't mind, I could just. Uh, yeah, Respond please, whatever you'd like to add items. to the staff's presentation, please do. And then if there's anything, questions, you know, we might ask you a few questions. And So uh, with our original application, um, the map that you saw was what our original application was. Uh, at that point in time, we were going to put in a 20-foot flag portion of the lot next to that easement. But it turned out that that easement uh, is to us and it provides access to the interior of our property. So we omitted the additional, the, like the post of the flag lot, and then put all of the homes having access onto that. We're calling it an alley, but it's an easement. And so the way it'll sit out, so now all the homes are what Lex was telling you. Um, they're in excess of 5,000. The one reason that that little lot four is slightly under is because it, if it, it would make the backyard setback of the house that we're saving less than is required. 
So we, we didn't want to push that in and then try to, I mean, well, we shouldn't do that. You know, it, it's, it, it's how the house works. Um, as far as uh, the orientations, the, the two lots uh, that are on 2700 East will face 2700 or 2007 South. They will face that. So they'll have a full residential front, you know, front gates, that type of thing. Uh, lot one itself will have a driveway. Two will come in from that alley access and would have a side entrance garage. And then three would come in off the alley. It would have that. Um, strangely enough, in 1994, I built that duplex also, and it has a car, it has four car carport and off street parking from that alley as well. And then uh, <clears throat> the home that is existing has a single car driveway on 900 East that will maintain, that will remain. And then the lot coming off of Claiborne will have a, a, a facing home to Claiborne. So everyone's backyards go together and everyone's fronts go the right way. So we weren't trying to turn it inside out or anything like that. It's not a court type development. So we're actually not creating any new streets with our project. It's a little bit unique that way. Um, just a couple other thoughts that uh, um, we, we plan uh, this neighborhood and, and Judy could tell you also um, everything south of where we're at is kind of pedestrian locked out. You can't get to 27th from the interior blocks. You have to go out to 9th East, up and around to catch to the bus stop and stuff. And so um, we understand that need in the community. So we are also going to provide to the west boundary a sidewalk uh, going inner, inner block so that you can get from Claiborne and all of those interior streets to 27th. Um, and we're doing that, uh, it'll be private ownership, so it's just on our lots, but it'll be an easement with a, a sidewalk for a pedestrian. Just another note, as uh, far as home sizes go, the homes that were depicted in those drawings, they all fit all of these lots. So uh, the home sizes are if it's a two-story home, it's about uh, 3,200 feet total, all three levels plus a two-car garage. Uh, if it's a Rambler-style home, it's close. It's about 3,200 feet, so 1,600 per level, and also a two-car garage. Any questions for the applicant? Great. Uh, we're going to step back and I'll go and open up the public comment portion of the hearing. Uh, we will start out here with a representative from the Community Council. Uh, community Council has five minutes if you'd like to present or, or add anything to the, to the record. Good afternoon. My name is Judy Short and I'm the Land Use Chair for Sugar House Community Council. Um, we like this project. It's, it's kind of a novel way to add some single family housing, which we don't have much of. Certainly don't have much new single family housing. I think you probably saw the corner today, and maybe if you live nearby, you're familiar with that wonderful billboard that we all wish we could take out, but we can't. So Mr. Nash has figured out a way to build around it and add five houses. Um, we like the fact that he is providing that sidewalk connection because, uh, as George will tell you, there are a lot of children that cut through to Nibley School. My granddaughter was one of them. And people walk their dogs through, and it'd be nice to have that interconnection because it is kind of a funky neighborhood with lots of long streets where you just can't get out till you're, you know, four blocks later. And he's removing some blighted homes. I think you'll see that with the, with the next project. This whole area has scattered blighted homes in, mixed in with some nice ones. And so it's nice to see some of this being cleaned up. Um, I think the road labeled an alley on your plan is really a, 
a good solution to get access to the homes in the back. You know, the four units don't provide all that much traffic, and I think adding a couple more homes off of it won't be a problem. And a great solution to bring it to the court on the back side. That's, that's really going to work well. We did flyer the neighborhood. We got a few people at the community council. We got a few email comments, which I think were put in your packet. And there really wasn't a lot of objection, other than several people did want that walkway maintained, because now the kids cut behind the billboard and behind the duplex to get over. So I hope you'll approve it. All right. Thank you. And then, Judy, before you leave, um, you have a second one also here on? For the next project. OK. Did I, um, label, did I label it wrong? You just labeled this to them twice the same. That's good. <laughs> uh, are there any other uh, comments here on this project from the public, please? If you just uh, state your name for the record, and uh, we'll give you two minutes uh, for all public comments just to keep moving efficiently. And for those of you who are here to comment, because we have a couple hands, if you do get a chance to just grab one of the cards that are by the door, uh, fill it out so we can add your comment with the public record. It helps the meeting run smoothly. If not, I'll call on you as well. But you're fine. Go, go ahead and just state your name for the record. and. Uh, Mike Jamison, I uh, own the property directly behind this development. Uh, Claiborne Circle, I'm not sure where that is, but that is Sierra Park Circle behind that. I own the property directly behind it. I'm not quite sure how they're going to access this. And I was, the first question I guess I ought to ask is if this planning commission has already set the precedent for this type of rezone, or if this is going to set the precedent. Uh, I think your property values, the people live back there, that the properties on Sierra Park Circle are, are a little bit concerned about having to have, go from one neighboring house there to suddenly have five neighboring houses there. In other words, another uh, subdivision be, being put in there. And I do not under, understand how they are going to access properties three and five. Because that is, see, that's a Sierra Park Circle right there. My property extends down there, and I assume they're going to eminent domain and take part of that property and blow a road and a driveway in there? Uh, I mean, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll ask the uh, staff. A question, that question about how they're accessing that property office here, just to clarify for you. And where, where are they going to park the cars for the landlocked, the other landlocked piece of property? That would be another question I would have. I mean, it seems to me, uh, I, I don't want to take, I don't want to spend my whole two minutes on this, but it seems to me that trying to stick five units back in there when four would probably be substantial makes more sense to me. And it seems to me like it would make more sense for the neighborhood. I, I just can't understand how you can build, allow development that landlocks pieces of property back there with no access from the street. And, and where are they going to park their vehicles? Thank you. I, there, there's, I have a bunch of other questions, but there's right now there's two preliminary, and I don't quite if, understand everything that's going on here. Well, if you want, if you'd like to fill out one of these cards uh, with any questions you have and pass it, uh, as I did with the last one, I'll kind of cycle through a bunch of questions with staff. I'd be happy to ask whatever questions you may have. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. Just Thank fill you. one of the cards you listen and pass it down at the end. Thank you. Are there uh, anyone else from the public? And please just uh, state your name for the record. Good evening. My name is Linda Thomas. I've lived in the neighborhood for 25 years. I have the property that is just west of this um, recommended project. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so the house, the house they're talking about taking down has been sitting empty for a while. And there's been a lot of like drug type activity and homeless people staying there. So my question is, if this project is approved, how long before this building will be taken down and kind of clean up the riffraff that has been created by the home being vacant for so long? 
Um, so that would be my one question, is, is a timeline on um, from where we're at today to um, pretty much curtailing some of the negative activity I've been observing in the neighborhood that I didn't observe before the property became vacant. Um, so my next question then would be, it sounds like um, if we're saying one, two, three, it sounds like property number three will be coming in from what used to be a dead-end street or a circle, and that would be how that one house would then be accessed and probably would have a driveway, I'm going to I'll clarify guess. that with... Okay. Yeah. Um, it sounds like this, the house on 9th East really isn't subject to any changes whatsoever, if I understand this correctly. It's just part of what they're calling a subdivision. Um, and I'd like to say I like the idea of this sidewalk going through from 2700 South into the what used to be a dead-end circle. Um, prior to that, the people that lived in the duplexes east of my property would simply jump over my wooden fences and cut through my yard, whether I liked it or not. And I went to a lot of effort to prevent that from continuing because not all of it was welcomed behavior. Um, again, I've I've lived in this neighborhood and I own homes in this neighborhood. I've been a resident there for 25 years. I don't really see any reason it could not proceed um, as long as all of the people in the neighborhood um, have a chance for their voices to be heard, their questions to be answered. And then my number one question is, is how does this affect my property values? Is this something that would be seen as a positive um, welcoming more people into the neighborhood, or is this now we're making these little small lots and, and little small houses, and, and does it then devalue my property or my homes or my land? Okay. And so that's my concerns. Okay. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, other comments? If you want to come on. If you've got a card, just hand it down to the one of the sides, and I'll call people. And please state your name in the microphone for the public record, please. My name's, uh, my name's Gary Wilkinson. I live on the corner of Claiborne Avenue and Sierra Park Circle. Uh, I'm concerned about the increased traffic to the driveway. We've got more traffic in that area than we need now. We haven't, <coughs> people come zipping around that corner and they cut the corner. And we haven't hit a kid yet, but it's better luck than management. I really do not like the idea of the sidewalk from Sierra Park Circle to 27 South. There's been fences there put up and down. The first fence was put up by a, a renter in the uh, duplex because he was having too much vandalism. I can tell when the fence has a hole in it because I get lots of trash, graffiti, and I have lots of trouble with the school kids. We, we talk about the school children needing access. It's no longer walk to walk down to 8th East than it is to walk to Sierra Park Circle down Claiborne to 8th East. It would be just as close to walk 9th East. Um, we'll get a lot more traffic. And I said, the access, if there's only one house, will be somewhat mitigated but uh, Claiborne Avenue pavement is about done. Uh, I realize our current mayor has doubled the budget, but that hasn't got us to on, on the edge of the city yet. So uh, I said, for the value, for the lady on 27th, I see her point, but those of us on Sierra Park Circle and, and Claiborne, uh, that sidewalk is very bad and it's going to increase our traffic and reduce the on-street parking that's currently mostly used. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You. Uh, we can't ask questions. We just kind of take comment and we'll stick with your questions at the end. Uh, please, sir. My name is Kent Franson, and I live just exactly north of the property at 857 East, 2700 South. I own the fourplex there, and I look onto that um, red house that's sitting right there. Um, 
I inquired about the meeting. I didn't receive this naturally in the mail, but I'm glad I came. Um, I have a couple questions. Is that alley there, is it a dedicated alley? And who owns that? Is that Salt Lake City? Who maintains it? Who will maintain it? Because um, the, I don't know if that's a duplex or the apartments there by the, the signs. There's a huge carport of, I believe, at least four cars, but there's a lot of traffic on that alleyway. And then you add, um, what, three more homes to that and garbage cans and da 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 da, da. you know, who's going to maintain that? Um, my second question is where's the Salt Lake boundary and the South Salt Lake boundary on this? property. Does anyone know or can tell me? Uh, just south and west, but it's not, this is not on the boundary. It's the, past 2700 it's south? Salt Lake City. Huh? It's, run, it's entirely encompassed in Salt Lake City, the, the property under consideration. Th this property is in Salt Lake City. Okay. And then um, the other concern I have is um, is parking places like this other gentleman. Um, for some reason, the council approved my building in the 70s with lack of parking. I've asked on some conditional use to get some more parking on my duplex. It's, it's bad. I wanted to go to some property east of me, but you, the council, not you personally, but you've been nothing but difficult to work with. Now, regarding this new development, if you, if you I would just encourage- make this your last comment. Hmm? Just if you could wrap up your comments. I would um, encourage that um, the, the house plans have at least room for, it looks like a double car garage, and there'll be two, two parking in front of the garage because all the overflow parking will go down on 2700 South. And that street is extremely busy as it is. Thank you. Uh, in the back. Great. So my name is John Blankevort. I have a house on 844 East, 2700 South. It's about two doors down from where the development is going on. And uh, uh, two questions I have are, uh, it's true that crime has picked up in the area. I, I get uh, complaints too. I, I wondered uh, what the mitigation plan is going to be to kind of look at that alleyway. It seems to be a, a place to hang out and it might, it, it might get you know, more kids hanging out there. There's graffiti on our street signs now, which I don't really like. Um, so I wanna know what the mitigation plan is for that. And also, um, a gentleman mentioned earlier that he's going from an R, one seven thousand to R one five thousand, so there's basically single family residences uh, that required a certain amount of square footage. Now he's requesting that it be uh, minimized to five thousand square feet. Um, I've seen some houses that have been developed, and it's got to do with the property values as well. That was asked earlier. Houses are very close to each other uh, now that they're getting put up. More density. We know a lot of people are moving in, and I'd like to know if that gets changed for this particular development, will it then be grandfathered in for other houses down the street? And would we uh, suffer from that or take advantage of that? That's all my questions. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and Mr. Chapman? Okay, I just wanna point out um, I'm for the project because I know the building that they're talking about tearing down. It is a hangout for homeless and drugs, and it is a serious issue in the neighborhood. I walked the area, and one of the reasons we actually asked for a sidewalk or an easement to allow school kids to go through that circle to 27th East to access the light at 27th South, 9th East, is because they do it anyway. They do jump the fences. They go through all the yards in the neighborhood, and that's the issue. And they jump through this area, and they're being exposed right now to drugs. 
and that's what, why we like this project. It's only doubling the density, essentially. It's like two and a half homes, and they're putting in five. So it's doubling. It's not that bad. There were some concerns about traffic, about parking, but the community around it generally would like to get rid of that house. This is the quickest, fastest way to get rid of the drug house, and it's a closed-up house. So uh, th that's part of the issue. So we really like the idea of the sidewalk. It allows the kids and teenagers who use the school field for soccer to get in and out and use the light at 9th South, or excuse me, 9th East and 27th South. I encourage you to approve this. And forgive me, I'm gonna fight the next project. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Franzen? Ken? Oh, you, it was you, sorry. I got your, I got the card here and I didn't. Uh, are there any additional comments from the public? All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing, and I'll uh, invite the applicant uh, back up, along with the staff. And uh, you know, for the applicant, I don't know if there's anything you specifically you know want to respond to that was said by in any of the public comment period, if you need, or if you want to, you know, that you want to have a chance to kind of weigh in at. Uh, uh, certainly. Um, just a couple quick uh, answers. So uh, the back lot does have frontage on to the circle. You know, could you the, uh, speak into the microphone, please? In, in in the public eye, it's often hard to understand that the sidewalk curb gutter and those things are like public right of way, and so it's hard to define. You know, where you think your property is. Most people think it's the you know at the curb or whatever, but it it actually isn't. It, and so we have frontage on to Claiborne as well as the other neighbors. That is the only home that will have access to that uh, directly other than the sidewalk that we're proposing. Um, all of the homes will have two car garages. That's our commitment to the city and it's also our economic plan for development. Um, we addressed in our packet uh, as one of our key components is the uh, uh, supporting the Sugar House community uh, Council's uh, master plan of removal of blight and reconfiguring of uh, odd shaped parcels and these alleys and things and then reconfiguring them for single family residential. So we think those are beneficial. Uh, the other thing is our plan to uh, remove that home and to clear the lot is uh, it's immediate oh as soon as we can get the approvals that we need to so that, that's our plan on that. Um, there was a quick question about maintenance by the alleyway. So it's an easement. I assume the alleyway is remain privately owned. And so you, the it's owners there, will be in charge of maintaining it. Is that correct? It's privately owned. So it'll end up being a shared driveway by three properties. And it'll be maintained by, they'll be the ones responsible for maintaining it, There's shoveling it. People who live there, it's it. just their driveway. Yep. Like asking your neighbor who takes care of his driveway. Um, I've got a few questions for staff, but any questions for the applicant? Is there like a HOA set up for that, for the shared alleyway or anything, so that it no. maintains its... No. Does there need to be? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just to ensure that its maintenance is kept up over... You know, I built that, that duplex in 1994. It's had the access ever since then. It, it accesses four covered parking stalls and two additional parking stalls for the duplex. So all that's going to happen is, and but the, but it's not edge to edge improved. It just has like a, a asphalt driveway now. So with the new properties, then we'll improve the balance of it. And it'll just, it's just the driveway for the homes. It'll be seamless. You won't, you won't know that you're on an alley. It's not a, the alley like a city alley where, you know, historically they were like, what, 20 feet wide and went, the distance between all the houses. So, uh, and, and do you want to ask questions? I don't know. Uh, the timeline. The question was the timeline, and I don't know if there's is there a city code that requires that when something's demolished, something has to be built. I don't. Is there? Um, I don't know if that's everywhere. Or, so I'm not necessarily in our purview. Yeah. So the, what the rezone. city ordinance basically says is that we won't we won't issue a, a demolition permit until the building permit has been reviewed and is okay. approved. So they're going to have to get that. And then that way, 
the idea is that construction starts as soon as right after the demolition. So okay. Um, and then the uh, the walkway, um, how how exactly would that work? I think that that seems to be um, a positive, a, a nice gift to the community. Um, and I didn't know how is it going to be like isolated from the house, that or would it be? Yeah, we we've, we've done this elsewhere in a lot of communities where, for instance, uh, on 30th South and 300 East, we developed uh, 30 homes with a little park on 300 East, but there's a schoolyard right behind us. So we took the opportunity between a couple of the homes and ran a sidewalk, and they're fenced. So both sides have, you know, brand new fence, and then there's a sidewalk. It's not a very long distance. And so the property owners, it's on their property. It'll be recorded on the plat. They'll be notified when they purchase the property that it's an easement to the public. It's not, you know, for them to put a gate on or something like that. And as with all sidewalks in the city, if you have a public sidewalk on your property, you're obligated to maintain that. Okay. And, and liability would be on the, on the homeowner? Homeowner, okay. yes. There's no questions? Um, I think you can go ahead and step back if you want. I have a question for Lex. For you, Lex. Um, one, can you just talk through, so essentially what we're, we're, we're making, we're, we're proving a zone that's a little bit more dense than what's currently zoned there. Um, this, you know, the, the whole kind of surrounding area is us all SR 7,000, right? Uh, with the exception of kind of right across the street, there's the RMF 30. Mm -hmm. And in view, in your view of kind of like densification or whatever where the word is, how does, you know, the 5,000 lots versus 7,000 lots compared to the RMF 30 across the street? Well, let me try to simplify this. When we were looking at whether the requested rezone was appropriate or not, we actually looked at each lot and each lot size per square footage. Uh, several of these properties that border this are actually duplexes, and they're on lots that are f far more dense than one unit per 5,000 square feet. There's a whole range of um, lot sizes in this area, but the request for a lot size of 5,000 square feet with one dwelling on it, unit on it is typical of that area, and it is also consistent with the density envisioned in the master plan. So when we're making the recommendation to you, we, we, we actually do some calculations to see what's actually on the ground, and two, whether or not it's consistent with what the city council has adopted per the master plan. So, just so I understand what you're saying, so you're, you're saying that essentially if you go look at what's on the ground, mm -hmm. most of those properties are operating as if they were the, the R1-5000, right? Right. It's so, not like where if you go look at, like, Yale Crest area, I'm looking at a bigger zoning map, like that, those lots are also R1-7000, mm -hmm. but the character of Yale Crest is quite different from the character of 27th South and 9th East. And because the 27th and South East is more duplexes, which is just more dense in general than kind of Princeton Avenue and those streets, that's why you feel it's appropriate to change. Well, it, 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 if, if the concern is we're, we're, you're being asked to create lots that are a lot, lots and the associated density that are atypical for that area, that is not the case. It's very typical for that area. And that's why we've supported the project. Okay. So this, I think I know the answer, but I want to clarify. So sure. making this change, we're certainly not, it's not the first in the neighborhood to make this change. And it doesn't impact the, the lots around it. This is well, only impacting these lots, is that correct? It'll impact the lots around it because there will be new development on it. Um, but in terms of densities that we see in that area, it's absolutely typical. 
but I'm saying it doesn't change. If I own a property near it, it doesn't change my what I own in and and the zoning that happens on my lot. No, okay. just just the subject lots. Can you um, address the question about property values? Because obviously you're removing blight, um, and these like vacant properties are going to be built, so that should be uh, positive. Um, I, I can give you my opinion. Uh, that sure. Criteria for opinion. which we can use. Yeah, there was like there were two comments about that. Yeah, so if and, you can address I, I, that, I can't really. I'm not sure it's a criteria we can use as a. It's not. It's an interesting question, and I can give you an opinion on it but it's not a criteria by which you would make the decision as to whether or not to approve I understand that. It's just like to address the, the concerns of the my, public. I, my opinion is that it would probably raise property values in the area. Generally speaking, when you are building a single family homes next to single family homes, that type of development, uh, regardless of a 1,500 to 2,000 square foot difference in lot size, doesn't make an impact on property values. The private investment going in, um, it does increase property values. So. Uh, and, and just to make sure, the, the homes are not affordable housing. They're not at the median uh, um, income. At their market rate. Right. Thanks. And just to clarify for future discussion, I, I guess I would think that would be a question that we would take under consideration. If we're changing the zoning, then we're talking about the impact to the, to the neighborhood and the community. So that is question that is not... That, the question is whether that zone is appropriate for that location. Isn't that kind of the same thing? Or isn't that what, what is appropriateness? Is, is it going to positively impact or is it going to negatively impact? You talk to a planner or a lawyer more than me, but I, 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 I don't feel like, to me it seems like that is. I don't feel like surrounding property values is a criteria well, that would and be. And you're also not sense. making the decision re regarding the zoning. You're just making a recommendation. Now the city council can take those type of questions in consideration in their decision but it, it doesn't really fall under your purview. Hmm. Okay. Uh, can you speak to the, um, I think we had the homeowner, it seemed to me, the, what he described that he's the house just behind on Sierra Park Circle, which if I remember from the tour was 2121 Sierra Park Circle, just because I remember that. I don't know, I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, and then I asked about the parcel. I'm looking at the county's parcel map right here, and it, it doesn't show necessarily direct access from that property onto Sierra Park Circle. Um, and you indicated that there was, that that has been taken care of. And then the gentleman that was here who said he owned that, I, I, I understood that he owned that house. He was talking about eminent domain or, or something. I just, I just, I assume that it's all been taken care of. I don't know where Sierra Park Circle is. Is that That's the one right Circle? behind it. Well, That's, it says Sierra Park Circle on the, the map. It goes from Clayton, and then it turns into Sierra Park. It's, a, it's the same street. looks like it just changes its name. As, as it, it goes, goes up and where does the it, L. Where it says Claiborne Circle here, that's actually Sierra Park Circle. That's what this the okay. county yeah, it map changes says. Name. Yeah, I'm going to let the applicant talk about that access. Okay. Uh, um, the, the property does, it touches the, the public right-of-way. And so we're just proposing a standard 20 foot or 18 foot width uh, driveway to that point. And, and, and the plat has been reviewed by city engineering. It's been reviewed by transportation. And city attorney. And no, not yet, but. So Lex, we looked at this plat and my recollection when we had this conversation was that there was direct access. But as I'm looking at the county's county recorders mapping, um, this may be a, a, a real concern that uh, Commissioner uh, Clark is raising. It's, it, it's, my recollection is that what I saw on the plat looks different than what I'm seeing now, and I, I'm not sure why. Well, the plat's inconsistent, first of all. The plat maps show gaps and overlaps and several things. We've had the property surveyed. We pulled the maps. We understand what the dedicated roads are that are around us. Uh, we, you know, we certified that and filed a record of survey with the, the city and the county. But you know what? Um, we can perfect that further. We're not opposed to that. You know, we'll work it out with the neighbor. You know, there's some landscape things and some fencing things that we need to work out with neighbors. Um, you know, unless it's an obstructionist viewpoint, I can't imagine that they won't want to just work with us. Um, the other thing that I want to point out, and I think 
Lex made a good point of it. <clears throat> so we're talking about five single family homes and Sierra Park Circle has, it has six duplexes on it. So I mean, what happened in 1994 is this area was developed in the R2 zone. And that's why you had this dis disparity of all these lot sizes. It only had the R17 put on top of it by the city when they annexed this whole area. It didn't mean that all the homes that are under it are fit the R17 zone. They do not. There's commercial uses, there's multifamily uses, there's single family, there's many, many, many non-conforming duplexes. We're, we're just talking about coming in with straightforward with single family residential homes on lots that are equal to or greater than and less than some of the neighbors. So if we're approving the, uh, the plan development portion of it and the subdivision portion of it and the owner cannot get access to that lot three because of the way the county is done and the neighbor decides to really dig in their heels that's sort of a problem for the property owner and not a pro i mean that's not something that our problem right that would be his problem that he can't now access his property correct and there would not be eminent domain in any event yeah, yeah so, the city would have to find a public purpose to do implement domain i don't know oh, that's, no yeah. it's not going to happen um good if there is a question about that, you can condition the, if you choose to approve the plan development, you can condition that approval that that, that access is confirmed. is verified and confirmed. And without it, if you do that, then there is no approval, right? Because then they can't do that. They, can, they couldn't meet that condition. Okay. And then, um, and Lex, just to get back to my specific question, so would you say, R15000 is more or less dense than RMF30 in a general philosophical deal. It's less dense. It's less dense. Right. So you there's a lot of RMF. Four, what I'm getting is there's a lot of RMF, there's RMF30 right across the street. A right. lot of it. A residential multifamily. This right. is a single family zone. So you're going, five. but there's a lot of it. Yeah, there so is. So you're putting in a less dense zone next to a place that has a lot of other denser zoning. Correct. Right across the street. Correct. That's all I'm trying to get with that question. Yep. Okay. Uh, any other questions for? Great. I'll um. You guys can go step back and bring it back for discussion with the commission. Or a motion. Next steps. I think um, <clears throat> there, there was a lot of really good points that were raised that were kind of concerning, but I think the, the owner uh, builder is aware of those and um, he knows that there might be some things he needs to work at to make sure everything turns out well. And um, as long as he's aware, I'm, I'm you know, in favor for this. But. I just wanna say I really appreciate how the Owner or the builder seems to be really trying to work with the neighbors, and uh, he seems to be taking comments into consideration. I really like someone who wants to be a good neighbor, so not everyone's going to be happy, but it's it looks like he's trying, and I appreciate that. I would agree. I think it's I think it'll be a good asset to the community. I think the the walkway um, seems to be um, positive. I I think it's going to help the community and. Um, the lot seems small to me, but hey, if you can fit a house on it and sell it, that's good on you. Um, so I, I'd be ready to make a motion. M Mr. Chair, can I just add one quick little tidbit relating to, to the motion? Because it is a planned development, at least portions of this motion will be. Um, in the motion, will you clarify that, that the planned development if I'm assuming based on your comment, you're making a motion to approve and that's accepted, um, that the plan development, uh, only, that all other zoning, regulate, applicable zoning regulations um, apply and only those that are specifically modified in this staff report are, are, are modified. Just a technical thing for Andy. our approval. 
So. And the verified access to Sierra Park Circle. Okay, I'll give this a whirl. Uh, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, testimony, and proposal presented, I move that the Planning Commission approve the subdivision and plan development request as proposed and forward a positive recommendation on the City Council regarding, onto the City Council regarding the zoning map amendment request to rezone the property from R1-7000 to R1-5000. If the City Council does not approve the zoning map amendment request, any approval by the Planning Commission of the plan development and subdivision request become null and void. The Planning Commission finds that the proposed uh, project complies with uh, the review standards as demonstrated in attachments E, F, and G on the staff report. And the approval of the plan development and subdivision request is subject to the following conditions uh, listed on the staff report. Um, and in addition, um, the confirmation of access to Sierra Park Circle and that uh, we're approving this as a plan development and all the other zoning uh, uh, requirements still apply that are not modified by the plan development. Perfect. <laughs> I second that. Uh, we have a motion to second. You guys did it at opposite ends, which is uh, its own deal. So Weston, you're gonna have to vote first on your motion. Uh, yes. Okay. Carolyn? Agree. Maureen? <clears throat> yes. Andre? Aye. Ivis? Yes. Sarah? I say yes. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, last item on our agenda, uh, Cottage Court Development, Zoning Map Subdivision, and Plan Development at approximately 3101 South, 900 East. Thank you. Hello, Commissioners. So I'm here today to present the Cottage Court development. It's a very similar project in terms of development profile to the one you just heard with some notable differences that I'll touch on. Um, the applicant, same applicant, uh, is requesting a zoning map amendment from R17000 to R15000, uh, approval of preliminary subdivision plat, and a plan development approval. Uh, and then the plan development approval will be for the creation of a number of lots without street frontage, um, the ability to have lots that average 5,000 square feet across the development instead of each lot needing to specifically, and each lot specifically to be 5,000 square feet or more. Uh, they all are very close, but just to be sure. <clears throat> and for uh, some relief from yard or required yards. The locator map, uh, the street there on the left side, this is 9th South. Um, the location is 9th South, just north of 31st South. Oh, sorry, 33rd South, excuse me. 9th, thank you. <laughs> I got confused, it says, it says South 9th, but it's South 9th East, whatever. Not whatever, but anyways. 9th East, South 9th East, just north of 33rd South. Nailed it. Uh, this is an aerial image of the site itself. Uh, these two properties here, and the, so this direction up here is north, this direction down here is south. These two southernmost properties um, were still on the site at the time this aerial photograph was taken. It's about 2014. Uh, they have since been removed. One was uh, fairly damaged by fire, and the other had fallen into some disrepair and had become uh, a place of habitual crime and other bad stuff. It's kind of a running theme in our two projects today. Uh, this upper photograph here is a picture of those two southernmost sites now uh, stripped of the homes. These other, there are two homes that still exist on the site. Um, the, the one uh, here on the right side of the screen is the southernmost of the two, and then this one is the one to the north. <clears throat> so what the applicant is proposing is the development of 16 lots in two separate phases, uh, with all the lots being served by a private drive, or 
eight each of the lots being served by one of two private drives. Uh, development in two phases with the southernmost happening first. The southernmost is here on the right side of the screen. The, the applicant also supplied a landscape plan to give a little bit more kind of clear image of what it might look like in development. Uh, all the houses will be will have garages which will be served off the private drive, so it will actually reduce the number of curb cuts along uh, 9th East from four for the four different homes to two. And the properties that are directly fronting on to 9th East uh, will, will have uh, kind of the, their front facades will face on to 9th East and then they, they have side access garages. So it's not as if you'd be driving down 9th East and looking at the sides of four houses in a row. Um, much like with the previous applica application, uh, the applicant supplied some images of what the houses may look like. The developer, the, the applicant uh, is getting the lots entitled for use by a home builder. Um, the home builder will likely be drawing their inspiration for the houses from these, um, but wanted to kind of make sure that we got through this step of the process before investing the capital in developing site-specific home plans, and they can probably speak more to that. The project was seen and presented to Sugar House Community Council, both the Land Use Committee and the Community Council as a whole. Um, they were generally in favor, and I think Judy is still here to speak a little bit more to their opinion of the project. But based on the uh, kind of staff report and our analysis, staff is recommending uh, approval of the plan development and preliminary plat and a favorable recommendation for the rezone request. And I'd be happy to take whatever questions you might have. Questions from the commission? Uh, so the lot's off uh, Gregson Ave, I guess it'll be on the back of the lot where you can't really see, but the kind of the boundaries of this development? To the, um, what I guess would be the east? Yeah, the east and then the, uh, yeah, I guess most of the east. Those are all the spe special development or special development residential pattern or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you, how large? Do you know how large those lots are roughly? Did you look at that? I, I did an analysis of the surrounding lots. Um, unfortunately, I didn't grab the map down here where I jotted all the lot sizes down. But much with the previous application, uh, there are a number of houses that are either have that are either on lots that are smaller than five thousand square feet are duplexes on lots where the net density is four to 6,000 units per acre, or actually across Ninth East from here. The, the city boundary is right on, north, on, on Ninth East here, so across the street is in county. There's a number of larger parcels, but those have anywhere from two to six units of residential on it. So the, the density is, in staff's opinion, in keeping with the area as a whole. Keeping with Gregson and Lincoln Street in particular. Yes. The four houses that um, the side of the house uh, are, is on 900 East. These ones right down Yeah, here. what requirements do those four houses, do they have any special requirements since they're, the side is facing 900 East? So in, a, in residential, single family residential districts, there's a requirement that uh, the front door face the street and that's not something that's been requested to be modified through this plan development, so it's the expectation in order to be you know, built that they would, the front of the house will face the street and simply the garage access will be off the side. Ah. Oh, okay. Well, this is the same deal as that the plan development we're approving is just the access to properties that don't have street frontage? Is that essentially what? It's the access to properties that, it's approving properties that don't have direct frontage onto the street the applicants also requested some relief from the required yards, um, which is, I think I've outlined, get your page number here. So if you go to the table on page 30, <coughs> excuse me, where it talks about the zoning ordinance standards. Um, 
They are requesting some relief from the front side and rear yard requirements for a different lot. Uh, but yeah, so it's essentially lots without frontage, some relief from yards, and then just making sure that if there's a lot that's say 4,950 4, square feet, the average across the entire development is 5,000 square feet per unit or larger. Do you know what the difference will be? Because so you're uh, requesting relief on the the front yard of those four houses facing the entered east. Is that part of it? Is that what I'm understanding? That's correct. So the setback for that, I think you have it ten feet. Mm -hmm. What do you know? What the there's uh, two other homes. It looks like facing the entered east. Um, that 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 are right next to this development. Do you know what that that setback is? I mean, will it will be substantially different? It'll be different, but the ones that are there don't are, are currently non-complying. So they're not. If if they were, they're not the twenty feet back that's currently required. Oh, okay. So we're going from we're going down to five thousand square feet. Although the lots there, we don't know that we the average square footage is one per five thousand. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they are all of them the are whole development, but not individually. They're all smaller than five thousand square feet. Well, they're they're not all smaller than five thousand square feet because then the average wouldn't be five thousand square feet. But they're all extremely close. Um, do we know those, the ranges of sizes? Uh, I believe it's like 5,200 square feet to like 49,000 square feet. Or sorry, 4,900, excuse me, square feet. I mean, they're, they're all extremely close to 5,000 square feet, but, you know. Because then they're, I mean, the, the relief they're really requesting is to go from kind of a four foot and 10 yards setbacks to five foot side yards, and then from a 20 foot rear yard setback to a 15 foot rear yard setback. Mm -hmm. But there's this, and they need those still, but there's, even though there's still 5,000, I wonder why they need all those for every property, but I'm, I guess I'm not looking at the development plan right. And still, but still managing, well, they need they need all those, but they're still. I have a hard time balancing, but I guess I don't have knowing without how much you scorch footage lot is. If they're going down to R one five thousand, why they would need those additional setback reductions as well to still fit houses because there's a ton of houses on R one five thousand lots. I live on one Weston, so I know it's possible. Um, so <laughs> why you know, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So the side, and I can let the applicant speak a little bit more specifically to this. Um, the side yards, they've requested some reductions in order to facilitate a more, I guess, balanced architectural composition on the front facade, uh, understanding that the there's a restriction on the width of the, the ratio of the width of the garage door to the width of the entire house. Uh, they've asked for a little bit more room so that it's not exactly a 50% and 50% garage door to facade can just make a little bit nicer looking product. Okay. Additional questions from the commission? I have a question about the, the street, because um, it was mentioned that it's not wide enough for like the trash collection mm -hmm. from the city. Um, so and can, yeah, again, I can let the app, I mean, when the applicant comes up, they can probably speak in more detail to this. Um, it, they, they will, the city will not, because it's this private drive, the city will not offer trash service down it, that the residents will be required to take their bins out to 9th East okay. and have them collected there. And I kind of asked this on the last project, but is there no requirement when we do some a subdivision like this and turn it inward and add a street that 
is a private street, but there's no requirement that an HOA is created for the maintenance of that alleyway. I mean, it seems like... I, I wouldn't want to give the impression to somebody buying that house that the city takes care of this and they don't, and then they're going to call the city complaining that right. their street's not being plowed. Right, and there, there's, we can't really require someone to establish an HOA. Um, you know, the, the property owner has a right to determine um, how the long-term maintenance and management of that property is going to happen. Um, and so for our role, um, as the only thing where we can require things like an HOA is through a condominium process, and, and we can't force someone into that process. So. This may be something that's already been discussed, but um, do we need to worry about things like access to ambulances or fire trucks in this situation? So the the plat and kind of site plan was routed out to fire, was, was routed around to city departments. I did not receive comments back from fire expressing that concern, but when it comes in for permitting, you know, I don't know if it, it will have to meet whatever requirements it has to meet <laughs> to get built but I didn't receive comments to that effect from fire. Right, I was just gonna, that, that roadway width, driveway width, whatever we're calling it, has to meet the minimum design standards to get uh, a fire truck back there and be able to turn around. And so, similar to the last project, if there's a requirement that can't be met, they can't do the project, right? And so, those are usually the details that are uh, discovered and, and worked out through the building permit process. But tr uh, fire uh, review, or fire did do a review on this project, it sounds like, and if they didn't identify anything, they probably don't have any concerns in terms of finding a solution. Okay. Uh, when the applicant come up, if you want to add anything to the presentation, and yeah, well, applicant first. So you're up. If you want to add anything to his presentation, and uh, if there's any questions from the commission for the applicant before yes, we go to so public comment. Again, my name is Adam Nash. Um, I'm also the owner of this property, as well as the developer and the applicant in this uh, case. If I could just address a few of those concerns. So different than the last one, this one will have a, a driveway maintenance agreement and it will be recorded with the properties. The other property doesn't have the same characteristics. It just had like a couple home sharing, one driveway. This has, you know, that's a, a component of this development and it has to be maintained and have that integrity. And so we're providing that and that'll be done with the recording of the plat. There'll be a, a maintenance agreement that discusses, you know, long-term and short-term maintenance, uh, obligations of the parties to keep it clear, to keep it, uh, you know, garbage off of it, not to park uh, abandoned cars. I mean, there's a list of things. It's, it's what you would think that it, it should be. The other, the other project was just a little, it's just different. But in this one, it's the same. Um, with regards to a couple of things. So we did the study with uh, the planning, uh, planning staff and we came up with the fact that um, there's numerous lots, particularly on the interior streets in the neighborhood and on the east side of 900 East, that they're on lots that are 5,800 to 8,000 square feet and again, they're duplexes. And so their net effect is that you have homes that are using 2,500 to 4,000 square feet. So our density is consistent with what's happened in the, in the community. Um, again, that area was developed in that R2 zone, which is why now it's in that SR1 zone, because none of the homes fit the R17. Virtually, virtually none of them have a 7,000 foot lot, and almost all of them are duplexes. There's like two or three single family homes that abut us and then there's a lot 
So we thought that this is a good fit. We did consider coming in initially and asking for a multifamily zone um, because it's a very busy street. We're right next to a very large uh, uh, church property. Pro the property to the south of us and extending into the blocks has been turned into oceans of asphalt and parking lots. So our, you know, our homes aren't a detraction as much as like interior things like that. And on the other side of the church, it's all uh, condominiums and everything, on, you know, lots of stuff on the west side of the road are as well. So again, we think we're taking a leap of faith to come in here and do, multi or do single family residential. We believe that there is a, a need for single family home. Uh, again, in following with the Sugar House Community Council, their recommendations. So what happens is, historically, you have all these like bowling alley shaped lots, and then uh, you'll have a flag lot, and then you'll have like a lot that's 43 feet wide and 252 feet long. Well, the Sugar House Master Plan calls for those to be assembled and to be replatted, and so that was kind of our guidance in working with Judy from the very beginning on this. I don't want to get long-winded on this, but you know we're, we're coming in. The lot sizes are we do have a minimum of 5,000. Uh, we've reworked the plat. Uh, we meet all the requirements of the R15, so we're actually not asking for a, a, any consideration on the lot sizes because we run 50 or 5,000 to about 5,400 square feet per lot. The larger lots are the corner lots because they need more room. And then just to follow up why we need the uh, relief on the, the setbacks. So historically, these homes were built very narrow and didn't have garages or had a one-car garage in the back. That's why the side yards were 6 and 10, because the 10-foot side would go against the neighbor's 10-foot side, and then they could both drive to their, their cars off of the road. But they didn't even have garages. The homes we're proposing are homes that will all have two-car attached garages with two-car driveways in front of them. That's why we need the extra room, because otherwise we are building houses that are insufficient for what the market wants right now. We would be building houses with one-car garages, and we're not interested to do that. We don't, I don't think our homeowners want that, and that's not it. They can go live in a transit-oriented development and walk and take the tracks and stuff. That's not what these people want. So. We're, we're excited about this. I do want to point out that, and Judy didn't tell you, this is the only time in my, I started in 1983, so in 33 years this is the only time I ever left a community council hearing when I was applauded. I've been a lot of other things, but never applauded. And I got like the standing O. So the community was really happy about this. Gets rid of blight, brings in stability, single family residential, owner occupied. You know, it, it, it's a great, opportunity for us and for the city. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Great, you can step back. Uh, we'll go ahead and invite the community council up. Just we'll open the public hearing and invite the community council up. Hi. Judy Short again. Um, I don't know how many of you were on the Planning Commission a year ago when um, Adam brought the same parcel, I want to say it was 3101, but it's some, some number like that, one of those skinny lots, you know, 45 feet wide, 225 feet deep, and we approved, and then you approved a flag lot. Well, that's still an awfully large lot if you break it in half with 125 feet each lot deep. So this is actually a better solution. And after he was through getting our approval for that, we sort of talked among ourselves, and I think he must have heard us. We said, somebody should be doing this to some of the other parcels on this block, because this has the same problem the other corner has, where there are some empty houses, some abandoned houses. You know, houses are, were built back in the day up to the front of the street with the big backyards. Probably people had gardens. Well, as people get older, they don't want a garden anymore, and the lots fall into disrepair, and people don't notice what's going on. 
And so when we flyered the neighborhood, the street that runs back behind, those guys came up and said, thank you, thank you, thank you, because they'd been dealing with the junk in their backyards. So this is another neighborhood cleanup. It's a way to get infill housing. I have to say, my lot is uh, 6,750 square feet. It's not a huge lot. My house is only 1,600 square feet. But if you look at what's being built today, there aren't lots with yards around them anymore. Four feet, a 10-foot backyard is normal. I wouldn't live in a yard like that, but lots of people like it. So there's a market for it. I would hate to tell you what they're selling for. You know, we, we got three big new houses on 17th South and 16th East, 450 to $600,000, you know? So it's nice to see families moving back into the city. So we have school children in the schools. We need a diversity. So this is a nice mix and we like it. I think hauling your own garbage can out to the street and putting, that's how many garbage cans? A lot, three times 12. There won't be any parking on the street that day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to we'll, uh, open the public hearing. Uh, I do have one card here from uh, George Chapman. Well, I want to thank uh, Mr. Nash for his effort to encourage the public to engage with him. He's been at the city council or community council twice. He's tried very hard to explain his uh, project. I don't like it. I don't think the community likes it because it increases density from four homes in a few years ago to 16 homes now. What a big increase. I mean, I can't see any uh, area that can handle that big of an increase. And Mr. Perretta, as you asked about firefighting, that's the big issue why I want you to turn this project down. They're going from 10 foot side setback and four foot side setback to five foot on both sides. There's a reason for the 10 foot setback. Firefighters need to get through. And if you have a four foot, or excuse me, a five foot setback, the people are gonna put in bushes or trees and firefighters won't be able to get back. And the significant increase in density in this project actually discourages firefighting. That's not what you want to approve. So I'm actually asking you to send it back and ask for the developer to figure out a way to put in less dense housing. By the way, it is not affordable. The report says it is affordable. It is not affordable housing for $350,000 homes. That's not affordable. So um, I also have an issue with uh, the trees are not being saved. And there's a city ordinance to save mature trees. The mature vegetation is not being saved. It's being cut down. Um, uh, the other thing is the backyard setback. Um, you mentioned the side setback to the west. That's not an issue because the west side uh, homes actually are a little bit higher. So there's not any problem with that. But on the side, or excuse me, the backyard setback going to 15 feet, it's a problem because those of us who have homes now have to comply with that 20 foot yard setback and now a new home can get by with 15 feet. That's not right. So I'm asking you to send this project back to the developer to hopefully develop a compromise to have less density and allow for firefighting. There's also a water line in there. I'm not sure who's going to pay for it. And a six inch water line is not good for firefighting. I think eight inch, maybe 10 inch might be required for 16 homes. So who's going to pay for that? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Are there uh, any other comments from the public on this one? Please come forward. My name's Clark McIntosh. I've lived in that area for 30 plus years, and I'm all for this because that has always been an eyesore, those homes along through there. One question I had is are the two homes that were on the picture, those two are going down also. Okay. I'm for this because it'll help our neighborhood, it'll improve it, and it'll clean that mess up. And hopefully, if you approve it, 
then this gentleman can go across the street and clean up that other mess. Um, it won't be an HOA thing, it sounds like. I work for an HOA, people don't like that, but I do. So they'll be held responsible for cleaning out the sidewalks and the driveway, that's what I'm gathering, correct? Okay. Um, really the only issue is she has a point of issue, that's gonna be a lot of garbage cans on garbage day, I guess that's just the way it is. I don't know how many people park out on the street, street anyway, because it is fairly narrow. It shouldn't be a big issue, but um, I'd like to buy one. Yeah, but <laughs> I have a rental unit also in that area. But anyway, I'm all for it. Um, it needs to be cleaned up. It's always been a mess, so there you go. That's how I feel about it. Thank you. Any additional comments from the public? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing, invite the applicant and staff to come back up. Any uh, questions from the, or the, as an applicant, do you want to respond to any of the comments made? Just quickly, if I could. Please. So, so um, I, I understand at my age and, you know, where we grew up from and, you know, living in the 60s and 70s, that a $350,000 house sounds like it's not affordable because our parents bought houses for 25,000. I bought my first house for 65,000. But affordable housing as defined by HUD is based upon a mathematical equation that these homes certainly do fit. And so when we say it's affordable housing, it may not be the definition of Salt Lake City, but it is HUD's definition that these are, are HUD qualified affordable housing homes. Maximum loan amount for HUD for FHA right now $417,500 and they don't lend more than that because that takes it out of the affordability index. So, you know, our claim it doesn't, we don't need to, to argue it, we're just saying that it, based upon the definition of HUD, that is what it is. Um, with regards to fire, um, so the standard of fire is 150 feet uh, before they have to do a turnaround. We are less than that. You know, the fire truck's like 65 feet long. So a fire truck pulls into this driveway, they're just gonna back up. I mean, that's a, their only option. And we're providing hydrants. Um, the, side, the setbacks of the sides, I mean, that's probably disputable about why they're there, but the city allows for four foot side yards. We're just, for four and 10, we're just asking for five and five so that we can balance the houses out. Um, it's also to give us the opportunity to do two car garages. There's a specific ordinance in the text that requires a certain percentage of the garage door width that has to be uh, held. And to even go down to a minimum double wide garage of 16 feet, we have to have a buildable pad of 40 feet. Otherwise we don't meet the uh, mathematical standards set forth in the ordinance. So that, that's the reason for that. And then we're, we're gonna build homes bigger than 1,600 square feet. You know, they'll be 3,000 to 3,400 square feet, uh, single level and two story. Ivis, do you have a question? Oh yeah, I just wanted to um, just maybe hear staff about clarification of affordable housing, because again, the way the application is written, it mentions affordable housing, but it seems that the definition is not correct. Um, with HUD, it is market rate housing. I just wanted to make sure that this is the case. Right, so I think that there are a number of different potential definitions of affordable housing. In terms of our, my staff analysis, uh, although the, all of the applicant's submission mentions affordability in a number of times, uh, in terms of my analysis of whether or not it, the development complies with the plan development objectives, um, in my opinion, it doesn't comply with the affordability objective. However, it does comply with other one, like at least two others. And so although, uh, you know, uh, given that there are different definitions of affordability, um, 
I think what he's citing is the idea that a house is considered affordable if it takes up, if you spend less than 30% of your income on it. Right, Which but is all very, homes then are affordable to someone, so right. that's not the definition. Right, um, so, I, so it's just so, yeah, it is uh, not affordable, but it's like um, it you is. Know, can, can I read potentially it less expensive? <laughs> hey, here it is: housing and urban development definition of affordable housing. Affordable housing is housing deemed affordable to those with a median household income, as stated, as rated by your state, the county, the region, the municipality, which recognizes the housing affordability index. In 2015, Salt Lake Area Median Income, the Salt Lake Area Median Income is determined by the Federal Department of HUD uh, Housing and Urban Development and is based on the U.S. Census data. The median income for in Salt Lake County area for, er, in this portion of Salt Lake County for 2015 is $72,700. Uh, mortgage payment for a home price at $375 a 30-year loan, 20% down payment, 3.5% interest is $1,347, plus taxes and insurance equaling about a little more than $1,700, or just over $20,000 annually. This is $215 per month, lower than the 32% stated by HUD. So we can fight words all we want, but I'm telling you that this is what our national government identifies when they... I come in with block grants. And yeah. So our there's probably, there's, there's more than, um, but I, I don't know if we need to go into it or not. I mean, the staff report doesn't make recommendation for approval for this based upon the fact that you're making affordable housing or not. And so whether or not you're making market rate or affordable housing, I think um, is not necessarily relevant to our discussion here tonight. It, um, it could be if you didn't, except staff's finding that the two other um, criteria uh, were being met under the plan development ordinance, but. Yeah, it is, it is yeah. important. And it's a, it's a requirement of the Salt Lake uh, or the Sugar House Community Council. And so, you know, we did a lot of research to make sure that we could make that claim. Ivis. Well, if you yeah. would like to, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you're probably yeah. better So I think it's, it. again, it's not, it's not, it's defined in the terms of like, yes, it's $72,000 um, of a median income. So that means that it's affordable to someone making the median income, not someone making less. But, you know, ag again, I think that there was um, other language about why this housing is important. So it's like um, providing more home ownership, providing housing options and other things. But I just wanted to make Absolutely. sure because it seems like there's a discrepancy in the language. Um, so so that, that's Typically be all. pinned to, to like either 60% of what median income is or 80% of what median income is. So you wouldn't even use, you would use a percentage of median income, lower than median income. Correct, but, but that's for but like, that's this like, is uh, This is pr probably not a discussion that right, any of us wanna like, get into and it probably doesn't help your case either to go into it right now. So sure. well then I'll yeah. I'll concede, <laughs> you know for sure. But you know the other elements are very true. We're providing stable, single-family residential owner-occupied housing, and that is at great need in the Sugar House area. And then I have a question for unless I have you have additional questions about housing. Um no. Well, you're, you're no, I, I mean, I did have a, a another question, but it was um, just about the property. So you're demolishing like four um, properties, and you're the owner. So the, and there's a renter in a property in one of those. My right? daughter lives in one of them. It's, it's your daughter. Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry, right. but she's in the master's program at the University of Utah. So someday she'll graduate. Um, <laughs> I hope, because I'm going broke. Okay. But so. The homes and what the community council and we have discussed for years was we started because there was a home that had been a meth house uh, certified by the health department as uninhabitable. We acquired that property with full intent to clean it up, came through the process, did a flag lot subdivision. That's when the community council said, hey, you know, why don't you see if you can expand upon this because we like the idea, but we're not thrilled about flag lots. So I went to expand. Well, next thing I know, the neighbor to the south, uh, through some questionable effort by somebody, his garage burned down. Well, 
then multiple calls from the police and from paramedics and from emergency vehicle responses. And about five months later, his house burns down. And I mean, it goes on and on and on. And then we have constant calls from the police about vagrants and about trash and about uh, health, public health issues and these type of things. And so, you know, the, those two houses had to go for sure because they're, they were health issues. And then the other two houses, they look okay from the outside, but you know, they're built in the early, early 1900s, 1904, 1908. They are uh, obsolete on the inside. You walk into a closet and it used to be the front door. You walk into the hall to go down to your kitchen. I mean, it's, it's interesting. You know, you have a door that goes up into an attic that there's nothing in the attic. There's no rafters. It's, you know, it could be, but it's not our cup of tea. You know, we want to do new housing. Well, I'm sorry to lose those two houses, but I understand that is your choice. I'm looking at the aerial view. Um, there are a lot of beautiful trees there. Is there any consideration in saving any of those with this uh -huh. project? Most of the tr trees that are along 900 each will be saved. The trees that were removed were dead or had been neglected for two, three, five years, hadn't been watered. They're, they were standing dead. But the trees that are healthy, of course, we want to save them. I'm a, I'm a tree advocate, of course. And then we, we will plant more trees and do a wonderful landscape job. But yeah, we'll, we'll keep the big trees. Appreciate that. Additional questions for the applicant? I guess I have one more question <laughs> about the, um, because we have um, obviously drawings of how potentially the homes um, will look like. And when, when we, we were talking about, um, or this is something that we hear a lot, like we have like uh, cookie cutter homes. So I'm just wondering, are you planning to have like the homes to look different from each other? Or are they this? We are. Um, I have a representative from our building partner here, um, Zach uh, uh, Brodsky. He's with Hamlet Homes. Hamlet Homes is going to be the home builder for us, and he could enter. You know, he can discuss that. But uh, working with the president of the company, his father Michael, uh, once we get this to a point that he can invest the capital without thinking it would be for waste, uh, they fully plan upon coming up with more of a sugar house design rather than a South Jordan design. Zachary Brodsky with Hamlet Homes. Um, just like Adam was saying, at this point we've yet to uh, invest the capital in developing product uh, as we don't know if it's going to you know, go through or not. As soon as we know that, we're going to start to invest. We've got an idea as to what we're going to build. Uh, it's not going to be a cookie cutter. Uh, they're going to be very diverse. We've got um, four different home plans right now. We've got Rambler style, two-story, uh, single family. We've, we're also designing a new product that we're going to be putting on the uh, front on 900 East. Uh, that's going just as Adam was discussing earlier, going to be a house with the front door facing the street. Um, it's going to have a nice wraparound porch, really beautiful home. We haven't quite gotten to the engineering of it. We're working on renderings now. I think it's really going to be a great, uh, great home on 900 East. It's really going to make the streetscape beautiful. Any additional questions for the applicant? Uh, you guys can go and step back. I've got a quick question for staff. Um, just could you, has fire, and uh, I don't know if it's, if it's sanitation, whoever looks at trash pickup, uh, public uh, utilities, who does? I should know that, but I don't. Um, uh, have they both looked at the this application? Yeah, it, it was routed out to city departments. I didn't receive comments back from fire, which is, I think, typical when they don't have a comment. Uh, I did receive a comment back from sanitation, or I guess sanitation is technically in the Department of Sustainability, um, expressing some concern about the number of garbage cans. Uh, if in fact, I mean, essentially saying that they, they would not be offering service directly down the private drive, um, and that if there was going to be city service, they would have to take the cans out to the street. And if in fact, sustainability determined that they would not offer service, that the, the applicant would need to um, procure private trash collection. And that is, that's one of the conditions um, 
that came back from a from from the city departments, which are I guess put into force and effect by one of my two conditions of approval or recommended conditions of approval. So you mentioned number two in Exhibit H. Exhibit H in our staff report? Sorry, it's actually G. Apologies. It's going to be G, and you look at page uh, 37. It's the second kind of heading under the plan development. Um, so I'm not seeing that really clearly articulated there. I mean, would that be something that maybe we should do as a condition to say, you know, more particularly that they, that this, that the applicant gets approval from sustainability. I mean, is now when we would, when they, or would they, would that approval come with building permits or something else? So if, Seems like when I, like, when I read the mm, comment, oh, sustainability is basically saying they've been denying permits for the reasons of having to back out. But what they say is like, so they can go and get private service. And I assume they're required by law to have some sort of trash removal service if, if sustainability turns them down or denies a permit? They are required to have something. So if, if they can't work with sustainability to address that issue, then they have to go says, with a private. We just can't do this. You guys are on your own. Yeah, and they would it, most, be required it mostly becomes a, a city liability issue. We don't want our, our drivers backing up on narrow streets and that go on to busy streets. So if they're denied a permit, they're legally required to go get private service. Yeah. Um, here, I'm okay. I'm just ask the staff if that's okay. Um, so. Yeah. And when you don't, you don't feel that we need to be more specific in the as a condition of approval or condition on this thing that we need to say you need to make sure you have get trash or service no because we're not going to do things like approve building not permits and review yeah it's something that they, they have to do they have to figure that out they have to provide it so all do you agree yeah i was just going to say they they will not get a certificate of occupancy from building services without having that trash figured out Uh, any other questions for, uh, oh, and then uh, what about saving trees? Is there something requ that's required to save trees, hug a tree along the way? There, there is a tree protection ordinance. It kicks in at the time of development, um, which basically means that if you're approving a site plan before a development activity happens, you're approving what, where trees are, if they've provided it. Um, and go for that so you're essentially through the plan development process are and if we want to approving. if you want to save a tree now is the time that we would make them save you would, trees. yeah so so if absent that say this is a regular development what would normally happen is that somebody comes in with a site plan they need to show where their existing trees are um, if one of those trees is uh, by ordinance deemed a specimen tree so those are certain species certain sizes of trees then they have an option. They can either choose it, and believe it or not, the zoning administrator has the authority to modify setbacks and everything else up to 20% to accommodate those trees, um, just by right, without any kind of process. Um, or they can basically plant an remove the tree and plant an equivalency of trees that is a two to one based on the diameter of the tree. So for example, if there's a 24 inch diameter tree, they have to plant the equivalent of 48 inches of diameter trees, which is essentially a minimum of two inch caliper trees that, that the new but, trees would have to But none to of that stuff applies because we're approving plan development. And that is kind of the question because of when that ordinance kicks in, it, it kicks in when they get permits. And so if, if, they have an, if they have an entitlement to a site plan uh, and approval based on a subdivision approval based on this, then, then that is essentially trumping that requirement. Okay. 
so does the commission want to try to save trees? I mean, Don't you're, look at me. <laughs> you're, you're the. <laughs> right, I brought it up. Um, question. I will note that I'm. Never mind. I was gonna make a joke, which I won't make. <laughs> I didn't know I was gonna be the hippie on the <laughs> on the commission, but. <laughs> Given our presidential conversation, I was not. That was my question, which I would not have guessed. <laughs> I, I do want to thank oh, um, Nick for the information because I had no idea that trees, trees had such an overriding authority almost <laughs> on certain things, and, and I appreciate the information on that. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I sure like the idea of saving mature trees and not just putting in five little trees to accommodate a big one lost. But I don't. I don't know. It's hard to make that decision when we don't really know. That's what I'm feeling. Where the trees are in comparison to the new development. You know, I, mean, I appreciate the analysis. I interrupted. I'm no, sorry. you're okay. Go ahead. I appreciate the builder saying he likes the trees. He wants mature trees on his properties, and you know, obviously those will help with property values and things. But yeah, I don't. Can we make a condition of approval that uh, the developer will go through? Uh, you know, a similar urban forestry requirements, the requirements that would normally apply to a lot development, such as yeah, I think you can because I think there's I think there's a standard in there that talks about mature vegetation. Because they could come in here and, and they could move if they you know if, they, if he has to take down trees, he's got to put new ones up. I mean, it seems like yeah, those I, criteria already applied. We just need to make I, sure I that think criteria. that you can you can add that as a very specific condition of, of approval. Just a normal urban forestry um, development process. Yeah, the other, so I think you have a couple of different options. One, you could take that approach where, like what you just talked about, you could also take the approach, for example, that, you know, if, if a tree isn't in the build, if a mature tree isn't in the buildable area of one of those uh, sites or in the roadway, middle of the roadway, that it has to be maintained and, and preserved during construction and things like that. At, at the risk of sounding naive, correct me if I'm wrong, so, but there's still, uh, several other steps that have to go after this board anyways going through checking with I guess a tree uh, also like the uh, utilities case. or anything like that they have to be checked still oh uh, 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 yeah obviously the utilities have to be in place I think there's mention about what is the right size fire line well that's something that public utilities and the they fire department are going to dictate okay uh, and and the applicant has to do that. They are, they're responsible for paying for those increased pipes and everything else. So, yeah, very good. Any additional questions for staff? Um, did we get any? Is it? I was just trying to find the street. Oh, there it is. Uh, Lincoln Street is the one that's. Um, I'm directionally confused. Uh, just south of the project. East. And the east. Yeah. Oh my heavens. Okay. Well. There we are. Uh, on Lincoln Street, those houses are, oh yeah, east. Now I'm thinking today, you're right. Um, did anyone, because that, I guess, just where the houses seem to sit, where they're going to have to sit, those, the houses are going to be the closest to those backyards. And did any of those residents get, say anything, I, mean, I didn't see any comments, particularly from those residents, as to the property being, or the houses being that close and overlooking their backyards? I didn't receive either phone calls or emails. They were notified at some point to yep. get into the process? Okay. Yep, they would have received both notice from the Sugar House Community Council about the application being made, or them receiving the notice of application from the city, and then they would have also received the postcard mailer advertising this meeting and giving directions to staff report and the submissions of the applicant. Okay, thanks. There's no questions for staff? Thank you, as always. Thanks. Appreciate your service. Um, question, uh, discussion on the commission? Or a motion? I'm, and, and again, I need some of the seasoned Commissioners, walk me through this. I'm concerned about a such a small setback, going from 10 feet to five feet. 
Is there, does that concern anybody else? You mean the, in the, what I was just talking about on the backs or in the front? Well, the they said they want to do it everywhere. So they're doing, right. taking four from the sides and making that five, but back in the back, taking it 10, making it five. If I understand no, I right, think the back did I miss one, that wrong? The back is 15. The back is 15, and the sides are The back is 15, then, which would normally be 20 or 25% 20, of the lot or a minimum of 20 feet. Okay. And the sides are so usually the sides were 6 10. and 10. Okay. And they're asking to shrink both sides to five. 5. All right, I misunderstood. Um, and, and there was, and I'm, I'm looking now, there is a, a comment card that came in through the Sugar House Community Council from... Caitlin Ridgeway that talked about the issue of second story homes overlooking their single story home. Um, and that's kind of what I guess what I was getting to is that, you know, when you're five feet to the property line and you've got two stories, then they are looking right down into Particularly along the east side. So on yeah. page uh, 24, you can kind of see a rough. Right, and the, the ones the, that are... So, yeah, numbers 204, 5, 104, and 105 all have just five yards to what is the backyard of all the houses on Lincoln, when normally, it's kind of weird going from a side yard to a backyard. Normally, you'd have two backyards, and it would be a much bigger space. And I wonder, I wonder if there's a... Well, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Is there a way to condition windows on a, <laughs> to ensure that they don't overlook the property? And I think they will have to go through another process to when they actually build the house to go over all that one day, or, or is this pretty much it? Yeah, it's all those standards now. It's probably just building permit when, yeah. once they come in. Um, you know, and the, and the planning commission does have some options. I think one thing about this image that page 24 that, that you brought up is that the uh, white squares that are numbered don't fully incorporate the entire buildable area of these lots, at least based on what the setbacks are. There's still lot coverage restrictions and things like that that kick in, um, but that's something to, to consider. So are these on that page, are these the footprints we're approving? No. We're not. This is you're just their the idea of what might area. You're approving the buildable area, and that is the, you know, they, in this zone, of, they can build 40%, I think, lot coverage if the zone gets approved. And two-story um, houses so would be normal in this zone? They can go up to 28 feet unless the planning commission restricts it. So, you know, if, if there's concerns with a narrow setback of five feet in a place that normally it would be more than that, then you know, that may be something that the Planning Commission may want to consider under the premise of it being compatible with the surrounding development. It seemed to me when we were out driving that most of the houses were at most a story and a half, being that there's livable space on the second floor, but it's within the pitch of the roof. It's not like there aren't two full stories and then a pitch. And so I would assume a 28 foot would allow for two full stories and a pitch. Um, so. But if you look at them, drawing right there or the the aerial photo it looks All like there's a two-story house there and there's a couple others that are which ones i don't i don't honestly don't remember seeing two-story houses when we were there i think behind or around the, just around uh, the curve oh we didn't drive on that street it, behind them on lincoln street i'm gonna have to find something closer to my eyes hold on a second here. <laughs> okay so there's a, there's a mix there's a mix of heights in the neighborhood and okay i'm gonna Okay, I do, I do see one two-story house. Um, and remember, I mean, a two-story house is a house that has two full floors and then a pitch on top of that. And that's what, there's, there's at least one that looks like that. One that I had noticed out there was, like you're saying, a, a story and a half. It looked more like an apartment building that had a garden level and, a, and an upstairs. So I think there's a mix in the neighborhood as it exists. So are, are we approving the, the, that side yard that I was talking about before? That's, what would that have, we are, we are approving five the reduction. Five yard along the east side is five feet. And we're approving that as a reduction? Which would normally be, uh, one side would be six, one side would be 10, so it could be as little as six if the okay. other side was 10. Um, but you could, we, we could require that 
setbacks along the east side of the property to be greater as part of the plan development process. But if I would, I will ask, let's talk and I'll make sure we get at least hear you before we do I something. I was gonna say, if we do that, then that impacts his garage size and impacts. Well, we can, maybe, right. maybe, maybe not. I just wanna make sure maybe, that. Maybe, maybe not. Right, okay. Impact the square footage of the home or how the home maybe would be positioned, but. And, and so now that I understand the side yards, we're, we're going from essentially 16 feet of side yard. On both sides. Total to 10. So we are dropping. Correct, but then you typically on like, you, like those lots there would be typically a rear yard setback, which would be a 20 foot minimum. Right. And now they're five. Right. And in between the, in, in between the houses on the new development, I don't care if you're buying a house now and you know that that's what the setback is, then that's fine. I'm more concerned about the existing homes that this new development would encroach on. And, and but it sounds to me like the neighborhood was happy with these improvements. Or they didn't. Yeah, I think the people who responded, I think, you know, sometimes people don't have the time and ability to respond. So I think that's part of our responsibility is to kind of look out for that, even if they may not have spoken. Mm. Um, even though I generally like, generally I would say I'm very much in favor of adding density where we can in a reasonable way. And this seems, um, very reasonable. And I, and I, I like the project for the most part. Um, I just, I just want to make sure that we're looking out for those, those people who have lived there. I, but if nobody else shares that concern, then I'm not going to. I like the plan myself. I think it's a great proposition. Um, uh, there are some concerns, but you know it was well announced, as as was testified before us that you know they did put the announcements out, and um, I would hope that people would at least send a comment via email or perhaps you know uh, something that we would know their their thoughts. But as as we've heard, a lot of the comments were in the positive from the meeting that they held uh, previously. I mean, would it be possible to? Why don't I, I would be curious to see if it, it would be still buildable if we required 10 feet instead of five on why, those Why don't parts. we invite the applicant up back real quick? And if you could just maybe address this question about that east yard boundary, and if you would be amenable to a 10, yard, a 10 foot setback along the east side. Or if, if I could um, move the ice bucket. So uh, the information that you're working from is incorrect. The side yards currently are four and 10. It's not six and 10. So we're not asking to go below on both sides. We're asking for five and five. That gives us, because in the R15 zone, minimum frontage of a lot is 50 feet. And so if we take the five and five, we have a 40 foot home. That gives us an 18 foot garage door. It's just how the math works. Secondly, the homes that are to the east of us, you have to understand, they're six, eight, ten feet higher than we are. And so it's not us looking into them. You get my drift. I mean, it's them looking into our homes. So that's not, that's not a, a true issue. You're looking at it in a two-dimensional viewpoint. Secondly, I've agreed to these height restrictions on me before, only to have the neighbors use the ordinance that they currently live under, and they build 35-foot high garages and barns. So. Everyone works under the same premise here. If you put a height restriction or a side yard restriction on us, it doesn't automatically go on to them. And so we're as much in jeopardy of well, you're, them. you're putting a lot of additional properties, additional um, subdivisions or you know, different individual properties on a few, you know, a handful of four different lots, current existing lots. There's six And I think the question lots. is that, you know, you're because of the way you're orienting your houses, which seem to make sense, right? You're orienting towards the center kind of alleyway street. What would normally be a rear yard setback is become a side yard setback. That's correct. And that side yard setback along someone else's rear yard, where that person may have a expectation to have a somewhat private backyard, you've got a five yard. It's only five feet instead of 20 feet. And so I think the question that Commissioner Clark is trying to get at very is valid. if we, you know, because of the weird line, alignment of the of the lots along that east side, what if we required a ten foot setback there? How, you know, and, and would, but we obviously don't want to, 
you know, can you do what you want to do? You have a better sense about it, or is that you know, with changing that lot to a ten year to a ten foot setback, or those just those four lots, we, or does that throw a major curveball into what you're trying to do? And yes, you, we cannot. I mean, we've gone to the maximum that we could and explored those ideas, but we can't if we're going to provide homes with two car garages can't build a two-car garage home unless you did some weird tandem thing, which, I mean, it's a ridiculous notion. We wouldn't do that. But for us to have a two-car garage and to have two off-street parking stalls per unit, we've got to have a 50-foot wide lot with 10 feet of maximum side yards. Or, if you want, you can okay. see this is a planned development issue, so you could tell us that we don't have to comply to the garage percentage. And then you could reduce our, our side yard. And then we could have a house that has like a big garage door and a front door. And then we could have a narrower house. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally following you there. I, the, I, there's, I think it's a, there's a requirement that you have 50% of your, the front of the house be, no more than 50% be the garage door. And so uh, I, think if, I think you're suggesting if we eliminate that requirement, then... On those four lots. They can have a on full, those four lots. On those four lots. Something to consider. It is something to consider. Was it looked at to put a garage at the end of those of the road so that it's the garage could be a zero setback because it could be right on the or whatever, you know, right on the property line essentially. Attached garage could. Attached cannot. Right, sure. But detached, then we, don't, we have to have six foot separation from a detached garage to our primary structure, and then we ruin the integrity of the lot. Um, the other thing is if we make the garages go to the east side of the houses, then all of our houses have driveways across their front yards. One, one option that the commission does have is if you choose to increase that setback, you do have the authority to to address that uh, minimum garage width percentage too. And so in a, it could be an exchange type of thing, right? Saying, all right, given the location of where those two houses are and a wider a garage that may be more than 50% of the width uh, isn't necessarily impacting the public streets and things like that and visually, um, whereas maybe the setback is a more uh, important consideration, you you can you can modify that that fifty percent standard too. I mean, to me, it makes sense because you yeah. that it's there, so you don't see when you walk down the street, you see garage, 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 garage. But here, we're putting two these four houses at the end of these streets. It's not gonna. Yeah, I don't I don't mind relaxing that standard on those on those four lots. I think that would be a good compromise. Is that something that would work for you? You bet. That's so, great. Yeah. So doing a ten foot side yard setback and relaxing the 50% front edge on, for a garage on those. Just for those four lots. Those four lots. Do we think that, and, and, and I feel like 10 would address that issue of the overlook, that would, that would give enough setback to. What's the difference? Yeah. Okay. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for your consideration. I appreciate it. Additional discussion or motion? I actually have one more question for the commission. We talked about not wanting these to be cookie cutter, and they offered that they were probably going to have four different um, styles to choose from. When I do the math, four down each street <laughs> starts to feel cookie cutter to me. Is that, does that bother anybody else? Or is four enough to add variety so that they just aren't all exactly the same? I guess my question is probably a staff question is how much say do we have in what is eventually built there? That's a good question. Thanks, Weston, thanks. <laughs> no, you're right, thanks. Yeah, it's, so when, when you're considering conditions, it's always, they always have to go back to um, one of those standards. And if, if you can tie that type of thing to a standard, um, 
you know, then, then you could probably do it. Off the top of my head, I mean, I, let me open up what those standards are real quick. Well, one of them is compatibility. But, and I had asked this question before, is, is that just talking about the lot size compatibility or is that talking about the structure compatibility? Because it's difficult for us to make a structure compatibility when decision when we don't system. know exactly what's going to be built. And that's what I was, I was going to look that up. So what, what it talks about is the intensity, size, and scale. It's not really getting into um, kind of the, the design features of the individual buildings. Okay. So I, I think that if you can say that because of the, the various nature of homes there or something that and tie it to size, Inten the intensity really that's not really it's compatible obviously because it's single family and it's mostly single family around it or more so um, you're really looking at that size and scale uh, I mean what? okay go ahead sorry I'd say just because you're building these properties that are back away from the street I don't think it's like when you're walking or driving you're going to see these are all cookie cutters it's not going to be like because they're you know they're only they're only visible to people who are driving down the street. It's the it's not like you're when you're going down Ninth you're going to see the same house sixteen different times. Okay. I I mean I I appreciate what you're saying and I guess I guess I read the compatibility standard, you know, because when you're getting the size and scale again, are you talking size and scale of the of the land or size and scale of the building? Well, and if you're thinking about it, size and scale, and you're you're also and compatibility, there, my guess is there are very few, if any, duplicate houses in that neighborhood. They're all kind of one single standalone with a different architecture. So, you know, we, I just, I just hate to take what feels like a little bit of charm in that neighborhood and just say, okay, here they are. But if it's not something we can consider, that's, I think I think it's a very nice thing to add. I don't know how much say we have on on those things, but I mean, I I, I would love to see variety as well. I think variety is always great. It helps with the overall, you know, aesthetic aspect of a neighborhood. But um, just how much power we have in that, I think, is kind of well, the main point. And I guess we just don't have a very clear answer on to. What <laughs> Is that what I'm gathering? <laughs> well, I, 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 like I said, I think if you can if you can tie it to the to the size and well, I I will actually scale of the buildings, and I think you can do that. And I will I will I think I can do that. Okay, I think I will do that <laughs> because I would like because I do when we're talking about size and scale. I think one thing that always pops in my head, and I appreciate that you're trying to do two car garages. But when we have a giant garage that, and, and, I'm, and I am looking at the samples that were provided and I understand that you're gonna be investing in doing some different things. Um, and perhaps providing these samples are not helping the case. Because when I see a giant garage door um, as the most say? prominent feature of these houses, I don't feel like that is the size and scale that we see for garages in this, com in this community. Um, they are usually behind the house, and they are not, they are not the primary feature. Um, and so, I mean, at, at the minimum, I would try to, f I, I don't know if there's a way to do it from, with our, um, in our purview, but I, I would say those houses along 900 East, wait, is it 900 East? I'm having a hard time finding my map here. Yes. On 900 East... I mean, I'm most concerned about those. Um, really, putting those garages. The garages are not 900 east. They're facing the end. They're, they're, oh, they, they are. That's those right. Those don't face okay. 900, right. so you're true. okay on those. So That's true. Those, those That's those a good point. Those won't have that face on 900 east. That's good. Thank you. If that you good don't matter. care about the others, then maybe there's no need. I mean, it's not that I don't care, um, but I'm less concerned about the others. 
but if, so if you don't but care if our about other the people are, the neighborhood, I mean, that's okay. I just, I'm not, there's no point in me arguing with myself out over here. So if nobody <laughs> else agrees with me, then I will stand down. Um, but I, I speak just to see if there's other interest. And I'm getting a lot of not interest. I'm getting. I, I don't think it's that important. <laughs> All right. Can I make one quick comment? Earlier, uh, there was a question about the HOA and roadway. Um, one of the things that, that, that we can do is that you can require a note that, to be put on the plat that indicates, similar to what the applicant said, that the, that, that, pri that driveway main access <coughs> alley road, whatever it's called, uh, is private and, and fully uh, all maintenance is up to, to the property owners. Um, that way, at least it's on their recording documents so that when they buy, thing, buy properties and sell, they, it's there. So. so, Clark, are you gonna craft a motion out of that? Um. I will. Am I the understanding that the only thing we're really doing is um, giving leeway on the uh, percentage of the facade on those back four properties? Is that in exchange for in exchange for the larger side yard setback? And do we have a very specific leeway that we're giving on the garage facade? I mean, is it going from fifty to sixty percent, or I mean, what would what would we do to? I don't know that we can figure that out. Because we don't know what that. Or do we ten, just eliminate it altogether? How do we do that? It's going to do. But we don't want a full garage front. Take up the full. Yeah, I think what let's let's try to think that through. Eighteen foot door. There you go. You can say in the garage door be allowed to be no more than eighteen feet wide. Okay, that work. That's easy. And are you going to save that, some trees? That's an exchange for yeah. a ten foot. Side yard? Side yard setback. Side yard setback. Yeah. East property. On those four lots on the right. east side. Okay. <laughs> you were and so good on your last motion, so you can do this. <laughs> you can do it. You can do this. Yeah, the eastern border of these most lots. On the east side of the east side of the east lots. This is a test. Okay. And then the uh, plat, uh, adding the uh, details of the private street being responsible. Right. Or is responsible to the maintain the street up to the plat. Okay. Um, and then the the tree issue. Um, we didn't. I don't know if we ever came to a conclusion as to what well, we were I, feeling. I liked the suggestion that any mature tree not in the buildable space be saved, is that what we said? Or in the road, you know, the road or be preserved? So, so basically, I, I think what the wording would be like would be any, any uh, I'm gonna say specimen tree, because that's what the ordinance says and we can fall back on that definition. But any specimen tree that's in a required yard area uh, be preserved. So uh, that way, it's, it's those perimeters that you've set, and then the roadways and the building sites would be exempt from it. Okay. Good luck. Michelle, are you ready? Okay. Based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report testimony and proposal presented, I move that the Planning Commission approve the subdivision and plan development request as proposed and forwarded forward a positive recommendation onto the City Council regarding the zoning map amendment request to rezone the property from R1-7000 to R1-5000. If the City Council does not approve the zoning map amendment request, any approval by the Planning Commission of the plan development and subdivision request become null and void. The Planning Commission finds that the Proposed project complies with the review standards as demonstrated in attachments E, F, and G of the staff report. The approval of the plan development and subdivision requests and is subject to the following conditions uh, as listed in the staff report. Do I have to say those? Um, and, uh, and, and in addition, on the eastern four lots, their eastern boundary setback will be required to be 10 feet and in an exchange an 18 foot 
garage door will be allowed no wider than an 18 foot garage door on the facade of just those easternmost four properties in the development. We also, yeah, is that good? Okay. Um, also, uh, any, tr any specimen trees that are not in the buildable area and that are in the yard or yard areas um, will be preserved. And recorded to the deeds of the properties will be the private street and their responsibility to maintain the so private on that, street. On that last item, it, it, yeah, you were doing so good. <laughs> <laughs> Not recorded on the deeds, but a note put on the oh, subdivision the plat. plat. Note put on the subdivision plat. That the, uh, uh, these are private streets and it is uh, the owner's responsibilities to figure out um, snow removal, maintenance, etc. Can I just accept that? That's fine. I accept that. Is there a second? I will second. Uh, I got a motion to second. We will start here in the middle. Carolyn? Yes. Maureen? Yes. Do you want to say something? To the developer, I really appreciate you listening Did and making, uh, taking our concerns into I need to make one question comment sorry um, similar to the previous one we need to add that statement that all other zoning provisions apply just if so if, if there's a, an amended to the motion to add that and then the second approves that would be great I will amend the amendment that uh, this only applies to the specific plan development um, standards. standards and any other uh, zoning standards still apply and, you, and we do need to second that? I second that. Yes. Start again. Maureen. Throw for a loop. Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Weston. Yes. Ivis. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Andre. Um, Mr. Nash, uh, I'm amazed how you've studied this, so thank you for all your inputs as well. We appreciate uh, all your knowledge on this, so yes. All right. Motion carries. Thank you. See how easy that was. That was great. Good job. All right, with that, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you.